la Red de Internacional de Investigadores en Educación a Distancia, en Línea y Abierta. Les damos la bienvenida a este evento. Eh, especial bienvenida a todos los funcionarios de la UNED que nos acompañan a este día y especial bienvenida también a los estudiantes de la Universidad de Costa Rica del curso de Paradigmas Pedagógicos de la profesora y amiga María Marta Camacho, que también le damos la bienvenida por hacernos el honor de estar acá con nosotros. Nos acompañan en la mesa la doctora Iliana Salas Campos y el doctor Robert O'Quan, que es quien es nuestro conferencista de hoy. Les recordamos que en la tarde, a la una de la tarde, empezaremos el taller correspondiente a la conferencia de hoy. Tengo el honor de darle la bienvenida y el micrófono a nuestra compañera, la doctora Iliana Salas, quien nos ha hecho el honor de poder darnos una pequeña introducción del doctor O'Quan. Eh, Iliana eh, es una de nuestras principales académicas en la UNED, eh, una de nuestras principales investigadoras, sobre todo en el tema de mo mobile learning. Y además, actualmente es la coordinadora de dos maestrías muy importantes para nosotros, la maestría de tecnología educativa y la maestría de, la próxima maestría de educación a distancia. Sin más, eh, un aplauso a Eliana y gracias por estar con nosotros. Gracias, Maynor. Bueno, en nombre de la Benemérita Universidad Estatal a la Distancia, les doy la más cordial bienvenida a la conferencia denominada La Interculturalidad en la Educación a Distancia en Línea y Abierta, a cargo del doctor Robert O'Quan, quien nos visita desde Canadá. Esta actividad está organizada por el Programa de Investigación en Fundamentos de la Educación a Distancia de la UNED, y la Red Internacional de Investigadores en Educación a Distancia, en Línea y Abierta. Les damos un cordial saludo a todos los participantes el día de hoy. Seguidamente, tengo el gusto de presentarles al señor Robert O'Quan. El señor O'Quan es doctor en Educación, Liderazgo Educativo y Estudios de Política de la Universidad de Columbia Británica, Vancouver. Es máster en Tecnología Educativa y Aprendizaje a Distancia de la Universidad de Concordia, Montreal, Quebec, Canadá. Es también consultor educativo con más de 20 años en planificación, desarrollo e implementación de proyectos de investigación en las áreas de educación, salud, comunicaciones y desarrollo internacional. Tiene también 25 años de experiencia enseñando cursos en línea y presenciales a estudiantes nacionales e internacionales. Es especialista en monitoreo y evaluación, también coordinador de educación a, a distancia de la Facultad de Extensión de la Universidad de Alberta. Ha ganado varios premios, entre ellos el premio Maestro del Año de la Universidad de Royal Road, nominado también para el premio de enseñanza individual en el 2015 y de enseñanza en, el, en equipo en el 2016. También pertenece a la Red Canadiense para la Innovación en la Educación. Eh, tiene un estipendio estudiantil para la investigación doctoral. Tiene también una beca de enseñanza de Royal Rolls University con tecnología y el premio Aventis a la, Aventis a la Investigación e Innovación en Educación para la Salud. Es conferencista en temas de educación a distancia, factores críticos para el éxito en el aprendizaje en línea. Sin más preámbulos, lo dejo con el doctor Ocuán. Le recibimos con un aplauso, por favor. Good morning. I did a lecture here. A lot of you were here on Tuesday. And I didn't have my translation thing in my ear. So I don't know what anyone said about me. I just listened for my name. And now that I hear it, I realize I'm really old. I've been around a long time. Anyway, so thank you very much. I really appreciate the warm welcome. Um, I can't, I don't have the words in any language 
to explain what an honor it is to uh, be invited here and, uh, and speak with you. I see this um, really as the beginning of a conversation that will last today and, and into the future. In a minute, I'll show you uh, my email address and at the end of the lecture, some more contact details. I strongly encourage you uh, to stay in touch, not just with me, but with each other. Uh, I think this is uh, really good. I want to start also um, by also welcoming the, uh, the group from the University of Costa Rica, uh, the students. Um, this is really wonderful. When I did my undergrad, apparently 150 years ago, um, this never happened. Um, it was rare that you would have professional development events in such a way that, that students would come. And I think that it is absolutely critical. For those of you who were here on Tuesday when we talked about the scholarship of teaching and learning and building networks and building communities, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, where we're talking about connecting to connectors and finding mavens for those of you who were here. But basically finding mentors and creating networks that consist of a variety of people. So I'd really like to welcome you. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you here. I'm very happy that you're here. I'd also like to uh, take a minute to thank Maynard and his team for organizing this, uh, particularly um, Carlita and Tatiana. Uh, for those of you who have ever been involved in organizing any sort of big meeting or conference, you know how much work this is and how difficult it is. Uh, and then you add to that bringing people from other universities, bringing a speaker from a, a country 6,000 kilometers away, um, and all the, the logistics that go into that and having me here for a week and so on, it is a tremendous amount of work. So I want to really thank Maynard and, and his team for that, and I, I would ask that you uh, join me in, in, in uh, a round of applause for them. Thank you very much. So, usually, I shouldn't say usually, but often, I like to start my lectures with a joke. And sometimes that's hard, because people don't have the sense of, same sense of humor, and then jokes don't necessarily translate across languages. So here's my joke for today. I want everyone to think about something funny and laugh. It takes a while, but people do get it. Okay, so I'm not going to say too much about myself because I think the introduction was quite complete. Um, those are my contact details, though, if you're, uh, if you're so interested. I believe this, uh, the PowerPoint is going to be circulated, and it's also being recorded, so if you don't get a chance to, uh, to copy these things down, that's okay. Um, and by all means, do do come and talk to me at the end of the session. And if you're here during the workshop, again, please do come and talk to me. Um, I don't usually bite. I know people are sometimes nervous about, um, you know, walking up to people. Don't, don't, don't be nervous about that with me. So what we're going to talk about today is the whole idea of intercultural communication. And um, for me, it's funny, when I, when I talk to people about sort of my personal life and my professional life, I really do <clears throat> live interculturally, and I'll talk about what that means in just a minute. But the way I came at this actually had nothing to do with my personal life. My personal life is very intercultural, and that's another reason why I'm not going to do much introduction at the beginning, because a lot of this lecture is actually going to, you're going to hear about my kids and all kinds of, and I'll get choked up and so on. So you'll hear about that. Uh, so I'm not going to bother at the beginning. You'll probably hear way more about me than you actually want to know. Um, but originally where I came at this whole idea of intercultural learning and, and what we call intercultural competence actually had nothing to do with my personal life. It was very professional. And a lot of it came from this book that I read by Jhumpa Lahiri called The Namesake. And it's actually a novel. It's not an academic piece. But it gives a really good description in the novel of what it's like to have yourself in more than one camp, in more than one culture, okay? And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. 
So I, if you like reading novels, I highly recommend this. It's extremely well written um, because she describes what it's like to be born in India but then be raised in a Western country. So you're sort of Indian but not really and you're sort of Canadian but not really. And how do you negotiate those cultural differences in terms of language, in terms of food, in terms of your daily living, in terms of dating, getting married, all these sorts of cultural things that we, that we take for granted if you're in a homogenous culture become very complicated when you have your, your foot in more than one culture. In my case, uh, it's way more complicated than this. This is my uh, oldest daughter. Her name is Emmeline. Uh, you can see, I think, actually I can't because I'm not wearing my glasses. Okay, you can see that she's lying on the ground and on the left are pictures that she's drawn and some of the writing which you may or may not be able to see is in English. But on the right hand side, it's in Chinese, okay? So, my house is very complicated. My first language actually isn't English either. My first language is French. But for those of you who know Canadian geography and history, when I say that, when I say I'm from Canada and my first language is French, they immediately assume that I'm from Quebec. I'm not. I'm from Nova Scotia. I'm not gonna explain all the history, it would take me an hour. Just to point out that this gets very complicated. I'm French Acadian, not French Canadian. And so the language is the same, French is French is French, but the accent is different. So it's really interesting because I go to Quebec or I go to France and I, I look like them and I speak French, but there's always that, uh, I speak French and they look at me and, and there's something not right, like something doesn't click in their brains because they know well, this guy's French, but he's not from Quebec. I don't, I don't understand what's going on, right? So it's very complicated. So being raised in a Francophone environment, but not the majority Francophone environment is very complicated. To make that even more complex, I was raised in an English city. So at home, it was French. The moment I left the house, it was all in English. And then I didn't even really speak English much until I was about four or five years old. And then I had to go to English school. So. And it probably sounds like I'm complaining, I'm not. I'm just saying it, it's very complicated. So then I decided to make my life even more complicated because my wife is from Taiwan and she has exactly the same issue because she looks Chinese, but she's not mainland Chinese, she's Taiwanese. So, and then she emigrated to Canada as an adult, had to learn English, and her English is perfect, it's basically has no accent, so she has the same issue. You look Chinese, but you sound English. So it's like, you look like this, but you sound like that. And it's very, very complicated. So now, that wasn't good enough. We decided to have kids. <sighs> so, make it more complicated. Now our kids are trilingual. We've raised them trilingually. If you come to my house, and I do encourage you to do that, please come and visit, but it's very odd. So if I'm alone with my kids, usually we'll be speaking in French. When my wife comes, and I'm, when I'm not traveling, I'm sort of a stay-at-home dad, so I'm home with my kids a lot. When my wife comes home, we switch to English. When I leave, they switch to Chinese. <sighs> I get lost. We get lost all the time. Uh, there are times, because my wife is used to translate, I don't speak Chinese, my wife is used to, to translating things for me. There are times my kids will say something to me in English and my wife will translate it into English. Because she's just, exactly, because she's so used to translating. So my kids will be speaking Chinese, she'll translate it into English. They'll switch into English and she keeps translating. And I have to say to her, I understand English, you don't have to translate English, right? And then, she, yeah, okay, I forgot. Same thing, if the kids are speaking in French, I will translate French into English for my wife. 
it, it's just, it's a mess. The interesting part of it, though, is if I were to ask every single person in this room, including myself, what is your first language, I suspect every single person in this room would have an answer. Most of you would probably say Spanish, but you would have an answer. In my case, it's French. Probably most of you, it's Spanish. In my case, in my kid's case, when you ask them that, they don't know how to answer that question. They don't have a first language. They have three first languages. They don't translate at all, right? What's interesting about that, though, where it starts to get complicated is when we do things like travel to Quebec, travel to France, travel to China or Taiwan, and it gets very complicated for them because in those homogenous societies, it's very difficult for people to understand that my girls and, and us could have our feet in different camps all at the same time. It's a very foreign concept. So anyway, just, just to make it... Uh, make it really, really complicated. As I said, it does tend to work a little bit better in Canada because we are a multicultural society there than it would if we were, say, living in Taiwan. I, I'm not sure that we could live this way in Taiwan. Um, I think it would be very, very difficult. So anyway, one of the interesting things that happened uh, when our kids were very, very young was uh, we wanted to, um, of course, we were raising them trilingually. Oh, and by the way, just to make life even more complicated, my girls, their regular school uh, is a French school, so everything is in French. When they send emails home, it's in French. If we go for s school meetings, it's in French and so on. Uh, and then, but then our town, which is called Kingston, Ontario, is a very English town. Um, and then on once or twice a week, depending, they also go to a Chinese school, so it gets very complicated. But when they were very, very young, uh, we were looking for materials that we could read to them, just storybooks, that we could read to them uh, in all three languages. And in English, as you may or may not know, there's a lot of really good materials for young children, books, readers with uh, nice pictures and very simple language, lovely stories and so on. There's a lot, there's no shortage. French, it's okay. There's stuff, it's not as good as English, it's, but it's, it's okay, it's good enough. Chinese, zero nothing. There was absolutely nothing. The only materials we could find for young children in Chinese were things uh, espousing the virtues of Chairman Mao. Literally, I'm not making that up. I mean, there were, like, his little red book would have been translated, uh, not translated, but sort of uh, written, rewritten for kids. Um, so, you know, we're living in Canada. I'm really not interested in, in inculcating my kids into Chairman Mao's philosophy. So what we did is we started writing our own books, and we started writing them in Chinese and decided that that wasn't good enough. Again, my life has to be complicated. So um, we decided that uh, we would write them bilingually. So my wife did sort of 95% of the work, and I did 5%. And so we have this blog, if you're interested. It has all of our books uh, in various stages of completion online. and. Um, you can go and you can have a look. Some, some of them are little videos and some of them are books and so on, but they're all bilingual. Now, of course, you know, they're English and Chinese, which may not make a lot of sense in the Costa Rican context, but if you're interested in that kind of bilingual education and experience, it's a good example of what you can do. Um, I know that there's a certain amount of that going on uh, here because uh, I bought a book yesterday that is uh, bilingual Spanish and one of your indigenous languages, but I can't remember which one it is. And I can't read either language, but I bought the book anyway, because I think it's a really interesting example of what you can do with bilingual education. So I would encourage you to uh, do that. And I've also brought four, because we've published some of these books. So I brought four, and I'm going to give them away. I haven't decided how I'm going to give them away yet. But before my lecture is done, these books will be out there somewhere. Actually, uh, what I could do, though, if you promise to give them back, because I, I do want to give them away, I'll circulate them so you can have a look. So 
So that's probably way more information about me that you, than you want to know. It's more information than I want to know. So, curiously though, my academic interest in all of this stuff actually had nothing to do with my personal life. In 2012, I was teaching, well, I still am teaching, but I was teaching more at uh, Royal Roads University, which is a very, very small university on the west coast of Canada. And we had, we were mostly online, and we had, I want to say, 4,000 students. And of those students, I would say maybe 500 or so were on campus, and the rest were online. Um, at a distance. And in January of 2012, uh, our university hired a new vice president of marketing who came in and one of the things she said was, I'm going to dramatically increase your population, student population, and I'm going to do this through international students. And we kind of went, yeah, okay, whatever. We didn't really think too much about it. By July that year, our on-campus population had basically tripled. So we've Imagine at your university tripling your student population in less than six months, okay? Add to that, again, because my life has to be complicated, add to that, most of these students were second language learners. They didn't really speak English very well. None of them were Canadian. They were mostly either from Saudi Arabia or from mainland China, okay? So the problem there was that we weren't ready at all. Nobody on campus was ready. We didn't have the student services available for them. We didn't have the classrooms available for them. I didn't even have whiteboard markers ready for them. We didn't have the curriculum ready. Our professors, for the most part, had never worked with international students before. I had, because I, I used to teach in Africa and I've done a lot of work with the United Nations and so on. So I was one of maybe three professors at the entire university that had international experience. We were really in trouble. Um, and didn't really have a whole lot of time to, um, to sort all these problems out. And so the vice president academic asked uh, myself and a couple of other people if we could help because we had this international experience. And so I started doing research in how to work with international students and that's what led me to the whole intercultural communications piece. And, um, and then I actually started teaching in the intercultural communications department. And it was only about a year after this, to go back to sort of my personal life, it was only about a year after this that someone said, you know, oh, you must have come at all this because, you know, you're, you're, you're a francophone living in an English environment, uh, and your wife is Taiwanese, and your kids are trilingual, and, and so it's really kind of natural for you to do all this. That must be what happened, right? And I went, uh, no. No, like that was the first time I had ever considered that my life was intercultural and I had been living it for many, many years. So it was just interesting how kind of serendipitous how those things happen. So I like that. That was good. Anyway, so what's happening though, um, at least for us, and I suspect this is probably true in the Costa Rican context, the common questions that pop up when we start talking about international students and intercultural communications in a, in a kind of classroom environment is, are our students' language and writing levels high enough to enter our classes in the first place? In the Canadian context, when we say this, we mean English. Here, of course, it would be Spanish, right? But do the students coming in have the requisite writing and language, critical thinking, that sort of stuff, skills? And actually, I'm not going to give an answer to that because the answer is really is really quite more it's quite a bit more complicated than we think because what happens is intercultural issues really start to broaden that question because what happened in, in our context is we would bring international students in say from mainland china and all of our professors really all they were concerned about is whether the students could function in english that was the only cultural concern that they had they weren't concerned about other things and i started pointing out to them that culture actually was showing up in their classrooms long before our Chinese students showed up. Because culture isn't just language. Culture is gender, it's physical ability, it's age, it's mental ability, and so on. So again, when I was in undergrad, my undergrad was in math and physics, we were a very homogenous bunch. 
Everybody in my undergrad program was sort of between the ages of 18. The oldest person would have been maybe 25 years old, and that person was old, right? Um, so very homogenous in terms of age. The genders were pretty much balanced, uh, probably a little bit more, more men than women, but kind of balanced. Um, there was, I never saw anybody in a wheelchair, I never saw a blind person, I never saw a deaf person, nothing. We were completely homogenous. If you look at our undergraduate classrooms today, that is not true. Okay? We have a different mixes of gender. It's not unusual to have somebody show up in my class who's 65 years old. It's not unusual to have somebody show up in my class who's, who for them English is their third, fourth, fifth language. They may have just arrived in Canada, they might be refugees, they may have visual problems, they may have auditory problems, they may have uh, medical accommodation letters from both from their doctors and from the university. The diversity of culture is a million times more than what it was when I did my undergraduate. And we, you know, we want to be sensitive to that. So for example, I mean, I'd like you to just take a minute to put yourself in a student's position. We've all, we're either students now or we've all been students, but have you ever been in a foreign culture? How many of you have traveled to foreign cultures? So half or so, okay, good. Um, how many of you have been a student in a foreign culture? About a third, okay. So can I assume that the rest of the people who put your hands up, you were probably traveling, you were visiting, yeah, okay. So, how did you feel when you were in a foreign culture? Was it really uncomfortable sometimes? When you were studying, does anybody want to offer up something? It was challenging? What were the challenging bits? Was it language, I guess? What were some of the other challenges? Jokes? Jokes? Yeah, absolutely. Jokes are a big deal, right? You don't understand. Actually, that happens to me still. Don't always understand the jokes. Okay? So it's challenging. Just keep, kind of keep that in mind. And so then imagine for an international student, especially coming to Canada, what you experienced is likely magnified many times because they're coming on their own. They're usually very young. They're away from home for the first time. They're dealing with all the things that a normal 18, 19, 20, 21 year old would deal with, discovering the opposite sex, being away from home, having to cook their own meals for the first time, do their own laundry, all of that stuff. And they're doing it in a different culture, in a language that is not their own. Whoops, that is not their own. So it's tough, it's really tough. And, and so we wanna, be, um, we wanna be really sympathetic to that. The other thing that comes up again is kind of related to language. When you're grading, this is more on the social sciences side of things, but when you're grading papers, I mean, I, I still haven't quite resolved this in my head. When I'm grading papers from international students, how much of it do I want to emphasize on kind of good writing and grammar and, and punctuation and all those things, and how much of it do I want to emphasize on the content of the paper? Now, it's a sliding scale. Obviously, if somebody hands in a paper that I can't understand, I can't get to the concepts, well, that we're kind of going to stop right there. But if I can sort of understand what they're saying and the content looks good, should I give that paper an A? Even though the grammar might be terrible and the writing is terrible, if I can understand it? Should I give it a B? Should I say that, you know, yes, the content is there, but the writing is so terrible, I just, I can't give you an A range grade? Where do you want to be on that scale? And I, I can give you, you know, like this afternoon, if we want to, we can, I can give you hints about sort of where I've arrived at in those sorts of discussions. But in a lot of times, those discussions have to be within a department, and the department has to decide where you're going to draw those lines. But it's very, very difficult. We do have professors at our university who I, I call old school, who basically say, they check the grammar first, and if it's not 100% perfect, whoosh, they throw it away. I have to admit, I used to be like that, right? Because I just think basic writing, in our case in English, basic good writing in English, if you don't have it, what are you doing? 
I would be a little bit more sympathetic at a first year university level, but by the time you hit fourth year, you need to have it together, right? So, and, that, and that's part of my philosophy. I get rougher as the years, as, as they move up in the program. This is another one uh, I run into a lot, especially with international students, uh, but with domestic students too. I like people to speak up in class. I like them to challenge me. I like them to interact with me. Uh, and sometimes, well, it's hard to do that. And sometimes it's just because people are shy. But a lot of times it's because their culture literally won't allow them to do that. They come from cultures, and I'll explain what I mean about this in just in more detail in a minute. But they literally come from cultures where if they speak up in class, if they ask a question, it's seen as challenging authority. And you do not do that in those cultures. And so that's tough. Even if I just say a word that they don't understand, if they put up their hand and they say, excuse me, uh, could you repeat that word? I just, I didn't quite get it. They won't do that because it's seen as challenging authority, right? Um, so, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So th those are real challenges, right? The other thing that I find, and, and I hear other profs uh, who don't work with international students say that this isn't a, a cultural thing. It's, well, it is cultural, but it's not an international thing. It's, uh, it's an age thing. Uh, in other words, I find that it's getting really, really hard to get students who arrive with critical thinking skills. So for example, I used to teach a course, it was basically on information literacy. And I would get students to do a tiny, tiny research paper. And I mean tiny, one page, a one page research paper. And then I would get them to choose resources and so on. And I would ask them a very simple question. The resources that you used in your paper, how do you know that the information in there is good? Simple question. How do you know you're using good resources? It is frightening the number of times I've had first and second year students say to me, I know that the information is good because I found it on the internet. People wonder why my forehead is red all the time. So this is, this is when I start banging my forehead. The extension of that, which is a tiny bit better, but not much better, is I got it from Wikipedia. Uh, okay, all right, we gotta talk. So they're great at going out and finding information. They can Google anything. But what they can't seem to do is determine whether that information is good, valid information or not. Is it, as Donald Trump says, is it fake news or is it real, good, valid information? And then how do you make those determinations? So I used to teach a whole course just on critical thinking because we were finding that students just couldn't do it. Um, once they learn it though, that's a very negative view, but the positive view is once they learn it, they've got it and they keep it and they use it for the rest of their lives. And I always tell them that. The skills that you're learning here in this class are not just applicable to this class. You're gonna use them to the day that you die, okay? For everything, even after you graduate, you're gonna be working for some corporation or a government or a university, and your boss is gonna ask you to write a report, and you're gonna use these skills, these critical thinking skills to write the report because you're gonna have to go out and get information to come into your report. So how do you do that? Anyway, so those were the big issues that we were running into. So I should have done this at the beginning, I guess, but this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at a series of cultural differences as, as it shows up both in practice and in theory. And then I'm going to talk, going to give you guys some strategies, uh, both for students, so you can pass these strategies on to your students that they can use to be more intercultural and to be more comfortable in an intercultural environment. So these, there'll be strategies for the students, but it'll be up to you as teachers and faculty and future teachers, I'm pointing at my, my uh, University of Costa Rica students here. Um, it'll be up to you to develop these skills in your students over the coming uh, months and years. So those would be strategies for that. And I'll also give strategies for you as teachers as well um, towards the end that you can use as well. But having said all that, I never got around to really defining culture, did I? In some ways I'd prefer not to because it's, it's a moving target. Uh, if I ask 10 people for a definition of culture, I would get 10 different definitions. It's kind of like science. Everyone kind of knows what science is, but if I ask people to define it, it's very difficult. So um, 
this is, th but I've found some definitions that I kind of like. Uh, there's one here by uh, Clifford Geertz, and that's very old, 1973. Uh, but he basically just refers to it as a system of shared meaning. I like this in some ways because it, it's very inclusive. So it can include things like language and food and music, but it can also include things like, as I said before, gender, uh, physical abilities, uh, age, and so on. So I, I like it because it's, it's, uh, it's just kind of all inclusive. Uh, but there's another one by uh, Goody Kunst, which is a little bit more modern, 2004. Uh, and in this case, they talk about culture is an implicit theory and a game being played, right? That one's interesting as well because that one starts to get a little bit bigger and it starts to include um, other things like, um, like professional affiliations, right? So for example, your university, depending on what your university is, has a culture. Even classrooms have a culture. Those of you who have a lot of teaching experience, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, you know what I mean. You can teach the same course over and over and over again, and you'll get classes, groups, that sometimes you just really click with them and you really love them. You know, as teachers, we're not supposed to have favorites. It's like having children. Like, you know, you're not supposed to have a favorite child, but, you know, there's, there's always that one student that if they didn't show up, I mean, you'd look for them, but maybe not right away, right? And, and it's like that, and it's like that with culture, so, uh, classrooms, sorry. And so you're not supposed to have favorites, but we do. And I'm sorry, I, you, trust me, you will. And then we also have classes where you just, you're teaching the same material and it feels like you're doing the same thing and it just doesn't happen. People are in the back falling asleep, they're on their phones, they're getting up to use the washroom every five minutes, uh, they come to your class late, they leave early, they seem very negative, you never see a smile on their face, they never ask questions. If you ask them a question, it's <laughs> like this. We've all had those experiences. Those are classroom cultures. Where do they come from? I don't know. Someone needs to do a PhD thesis on this. Where do those classroom cultures come from, right? But just get used to it. It just happens, right? So I like this second definition because it does kind of become a game, right? Because I'll go home at night and I'll go, I don't understand why I can't connect with this group. And so I try to come up with different ways of trying to connect. Um, sometimes I'm more successful than others. So I like that one. I'm not sure how easy it is to look at this. I like this model. Uh, this is a slightly different model. Uh, it's an, an illustrated interpretation of the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, DMIS. That's a really complicated way of saying that when we start working with different cultures, we go through different stages. And I know this is really hard to read, uh, but I'm going to go through it. And probably you're going to recognize, especially if you've ever taken a psychology course, you're going to look like, uh, you, you're going to recognize that this sounds like a, a lot like the is it five? The five stages of grief. So the first stage is denial. Denial, you just deny that there's any real cultural differences, right? So um, I don't think that cultural differences exist at all. We're all just one big happy family. Uh, we're all human beings. And so there are, you know, this whole discussion of culture is kind of silly. That's kind of the first stage. The second stage is called defense. And it says, well, I offered my home uh, culture, or I, I prefer my co home culture because I love, you know, what I'm used to, that kind of thing, right? So they're beginning to recognize that there are some differences, but there's a distinct preference for their home culture. It's kind of a defensive position, right? So it's almost like, yeah, you can have your culture, you can have your language, just kind of don't do it in my living room, okay? So that's the defensive position. I don't meet very many people anymore that are in either of those positions. But 10, 20 years ago, this was not unusual to run into people like this. Minimization is stage three. I minimize differences. It's almost going back to denial. Um, so basically, you're acknowledging that there are cultural differences, but you're saying, yeah, but maybe it's not that big of a deal. OK, so you speak Spanish, and I speak English, but Maynard speaks both. He'll translate. We'll all be happy. Everything's fine, right? 
I meet a lot of people there in that stage, minimization. So they're aware of a culture, cultural differences, they accept it, that's pretty much it. Acceptance is the next stage, right? Uh, they're definitely sure that there are diverse cultural differences, there are diverse cultures and so on. They're starting to get interested in learning about the other cultures, but they're not really interested in sort of immersing themselves in other cultures. Then there's ad adaptation, where this is where, in my field, where most people are. Oh, by the way, we're going to be serenaded all morning by the music next door. And occasionally I will stop because it's, I, I can't talk over that. Okay. How are we doing so far? Okay. Anyway, so adaptation is, is kind of where I find most people are. It's where uh, you get excited about different cultures, uh, you recognize there are different cultures, you may even be interested in learning about those different cultures, learning new languages, trying new food. I've been eating a lot of Costa Rican food since I've been here. Uh, I'd like to say all this extra weight has just been since last Saturday. Um, and it's great, even just things, you know, trying different beers if you're into that and so on. So that's adaptation. You're really interested in experimenting with new cultures, having new cultures visit you, and so on and so forth. Integration is the last stage, and it's difficult. And the problem with integration is, is sometimes you're in and out, in and out, in and out. I would like to think that in my case, I'm in the integration stage because I live it. I live an intercultural life, um, both personally and professionally. Oh, that feels so much better that that's done. Um, so those are different stages. That, uh, that you can go through. But it's just an interesting idea that, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, even if I was teaching this as a class, I wouldn't ask anyone to sort of memorize this model. I'm not asking you to remember it. But it's just a, an interesting model because it presents the way that uh, intercultural communication can be a gradation. It can be like a spectrum. It's not, it's not strictly a hierarchy. So I like that. I love this cartoon. Okay. This is always a dangerous question. This is one of the most dangerous questions I ever ask in a class, at least in Canada. How many of you are cat people? Ooh, I'm very disappointed. Okay, how many of you are dog people? Oh, God. Hey, get out. No, I'm just kidding. How, okay, actually, how many of you are both? Okay. That is a danger. You can get beaten up for that question. Okay, so those of you who are either cat people or dog people or both, this cartoon should mean something to you, right? Um, if a cat raises its tail or wags its tail, it does not mean the same thing as when a dog wags its tail, okay? I have cats at home and I have to constantly remind my kids, if you see the cat twitching its tail, if you, you go ahead, you play with it if you want, but be prepared for the results, okay? Because she's big and she can play rough. Whereas if a dog is wagging its tail, usually it means he's pretty happy, right? So it's completely different. So I'm not sure how well you can read that, but the dog is saying to its other friend, did you know that when a cat wags its tail, it means something completely different, right? And you can see, hopefully, that the dog that's saying that's got bandages everywhere. So obviously the cat, we, we call it, we call it putting red stripes on it, right? Because that's what a cat does. It'll put red stripes on you. Anyway, so, so that's kind of what we mean by culture, okay? And it can, it can be quite different, and it can be fun. It can be enjoyable. There's a lot of really interesting opportunities that come along with those differences. But there are some dangers, I guess. I mean, that's probably an exaggeration. But, uh, and so the idea is, oh, God. The idea is to be sensitive to those differences and hopefully exploit those differences to create really interesting opportunities. In my case, it's learning opportunities because I'm an educator. But for some of you, I know some of you are researchers, so these differences might be interesting to create research opportunities. Or some of you are activists, so they might be good at creating activism opportunities or they might be uh, good at creating opportunities in your personal life, right? If you 
have a friend or maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife who's from a different culture. It creates very interesting opportunities for you, and it's, and it's exciting. I mean, it's fun. That's one of the reasons why I do this. I just think it's fun. Um, but in the, I'm going to try to focus as much as I can in this lecture on, on the implications for the classroom. And so the question is, you know, what are the consequences of misunderstanding culture? Well, here's one. The question I always ask, and I have a really hard time answering this question, is do our students, when they come into the classroom, do they understand our implicit rules? And do we explain these rules? And why or why not? And then how do we explain them? So one of the issues we had, for those of you who have been to Canada, you know that if you say, if I say to you, we're going to meet at 9 o'clock, or the class starts at 9 o'clock, and this is going to sound like I'm picking on you and I'm not. If I say the class starts at 9 o'clock, what time does the class start? 9 o'clock. If I say the class starts at 9 o'clock, what time will most people, Canadians, show up? Well, maybe not 8, but... Yeah, like 5, 10 minutes early, right? I mean, when I was growing up, the rule was, if you're not 10 minutes early, you're late. Right? So, but in, in most countries in the world, that's not true, right? This thing was scheduled for 9 o'clock. We started, I think it was 9.10. On Tuesday, we started at 9.15 and so on. 15, 20 years ago, that would have driven me crazy. If you're going to start at... If we're going to start at 9, start at 9. If you want to start it at 9.15, that's okay, but say you're starting at 9.15. That would have driven me batty. I would have gone completely crazy. Nowadays, eh, whatever. I was here early, and I'm happy to be here early. I know some of you guys came in early gave me a chance to come and greet some of you and talk to the students and so on, and I just, I don't worry about it anymore. But 15 years ago, that would have driven me nuts. So, but in a classroom situation, it does still drive me nuts. When I'm teaching a class, if it starts at 9, I might allow them 5 minutes grace, but at 5 minutes past 9, that door is shut, and I don't let students in. And I now explain that to them because when I get students from other cultures, they don't always know that. They think that they can just kind of come and go as they please, and in their home cultures, probably that's okay. But from my point of view, partially it's a, it's a, it's a respect thing. If I say, you know, I'm the professor, if I expect you there at 9, I'd like you to be there at 9. Partially it's, it's the fact that when someone comes in at the last minute, they're disturbing the other students, they're, you know, they're making noise with their book bags and getting all their stuff out and they're scraping chairs on the floor. And then because they're 10, 15 minutes late, they're nudging the person next to them saying, what, what did I miss? What did I miss? What were the, can I see your notes? Blah, 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 blah. And so then it starts this whole conversation. So it's very disturbing. So I just don't allow it in my classes. I might give, depending on what's going on, I might give them five minutes. But I tell them, if you're more than five minutes late, don't come. Talk to me later, right? And then I'll get students saying, oh, I missed this last class because I was late. Can you, you tell me what you did in class? No. No, I'm not doing that. But a lot of people who are immersed in this field in intercultural communication think that I'm really quite mean about that. And maybe I am, but, you know, that's my orientation. But I explain it to the students. It's not implicit, it's explicit. The students know from day one, I put it in writing, we have a learning contract, you will be in class on time. And they sign the contract. And then if they don't live up to the contract, they have to understand there are consequences. And the consequences are that they have to find out what the material was on their own. I'm not going to give them the material. I'm not going to teach the class a second time. So that's a question that you'll have to start asking yourselves. What are the sort of implicit rules that you have in your classrooms that perhaps your students don't know? Okay. Uh, other things that may show up more often in Costa Rica than the late issue, things like using technology in the classroom. For those of you who teach face-to-face, -face, are you okay? I don't have my phone. Are you okay if somebody is sitting at the back on their phone. How many people are okay with that? Does the university have rules around that? Of course, you're, you do most of your teaching online, so maybe it doesn't matter. Okay. 
But not necessarily. Yeah. Except not necessarily. I know profs who have a box at the door. Yeah. And you put your phone in the box when you come in the door and you pick it up on your way out. Now, I've never done that. I've never done that. I did consider one time and was told I wasn't allowed. You can buy this box that will actually jam all the Wi-Fi signals. It's like 150 bucks or something. And I did consider getting one, but I was told that I could get into a lot of trouble if I did that. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't do it. Anyway, um, another thing that shows up, and this, it doesn't matter if it's face-to-face -face or um, uh, online, plagiarism. Now, never in a million years did I think plagiarism would be a cultural issue. But I found, especially with teaching uh, students from mainland China, it is. So, the way I was trained is, if you copy somebody's work and you don't kind of put a reference at the end or you don't quote it, that's called plagiarism and you can be kicked out of the university for that. It's very simple. In mainland China, they don't quite see it that way. The way they see it is, if, if me, as a brilliant scholar, has all these publications out there, and you, as a first or second year student, copy those publications, that's a sign of respect. They actually see plagiarism in a positive light. They see it as honoring the person. So again, we have to dance around that with these students, and we basically say, yeah, okay, it's fine. If you want to copy these works, parts of these works, it's okay, but you need to give credit. I need to know which works you're, you're working from, basically. And that's a very hard lesson for them to get. And up until the time we started getting international students, we never bothered explaining any of that, because we just thought, well, you, and plagiarism's plagiarism. How could you not know what that is? Excuse me. But, but they don't know. Okay. Um, I include this slide because, again, this lecture is mostly from the sort of Canadian context. In the Canadian context, we have two different ideas uh, that the two words, and they're often used interchangeably, but they're not quite the same. One is multicultural, so people will often describe Canada as a multicultural society uh, because, you know, our Canadian population, we're about 35 million people now. Uh, it represents literally tens of thousands or thousands of cultures, different languages. And depending on where you're living, you can sometimes experience dozens of cultures within one city block within a half an hour. So if, you have, if you're lucky enough to go to one of our larger cities like Montreal or Toronto, and you go downtown and you just sit in a coffee shop and you just sit there for 20 minutes, I can pretty much guarantee you that you'll hear at least five or six different languages just sitting there. Sometimes, and I love this, sometimes you'll hear five or six different languages at the same table, right? So I don't know how many women are sitting here. It looks like there's about eight of you. Uh, you might be speaking three or four different languages. And it gets very interesting, right? Because sometimes I work in French. So sometimes, in fact, this happened to us yesterday. Sometimes I work in French and we'll be in meetings, but they're not French meetings. They're bilingual meetings. So I'll say something in French. The person will respond in English. And then I'll, I'll switch to English, and they'll switch to French, and it just keeps going back and forth. And, and it's really quite interesting. So that's multicultural. Intercultural is a little bit different, though. Intercultural is more that kind of integration. How do you negotiate and work between two or more cultures? Right? So in my case, how do I integrate, how do I work with my Chinese colleagues? How do I, I do a lot of work in Africa as well, mostly in Zambia now. Uh, and I do a lot of work for the United Nations High Commission, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So I'm literally dealing with hundreds of cultures every week. How do I negotiate all those different cultures and all those different um, languages and all those different backgrounds? So that's intercultural. Those two words often get used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. So this is a kind of a strong statement, but I like it. And then I'm going to get into some of the practical theory of of this. Uh, but if education is not intercultural, it's probably not education. Now that's harsh. That's a very strong statement. If as educators, as scholars, for those of you who are here on Tuesday, if, if as scholars you're not being intercultural, you're probably not really engaged in education. But rather you're inculcating nationalist or kind of religious fundamentalism. 
that is a very strong statement. I actually think it's a little too strong, but I include it because it, it, I think it's really important. This is 2018, the day of those homogenous classrooms and homogenous work environments I think are largely gone. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay. I know if I put my water up here, I'll knock it off. And it's glass, so it'll break. Okay. Let's talk about um, different, sorry, okay, different types of cultural, we call them orientations or dimensions. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to get this shut off. Oh, there we go. So I want to, and, and these, the, well, I'm going to go through a whole series of them. There's actually quite a few uh, more than what I'm going to present, but this, this will give you a sense of the different types of cultural orientations. This one I've already discussed with you. Um, but they're just different ways of, of considering culture, okay? So, and all of the ones that I'm going to show you uh, have been quite thoroughly researched, uh, both theoretically and practically. They've been validated and so on. You can go into the peer-reviewed literature and you'll find lots of information about all of these orientations. That's why I picked these ones. There are some others that are interesting and probably correct, but they haven't really been proven empirically yet, so I, I don't typically include those. Um, we're just not ready yet. Um, but anyway, so these are, these are some of the ones. So the earliest one that I know of is the one that I already talked about, developed by Edward Hall in the 1950s. Um, and it's, it's called time orientation, and we talk about monochronic versus polychronic time orientation. Now, I should mention that all of the orientations I'm going to explain to you, I'm presenting them as uh, dichotomies. So you're either A or you're B. And we always teach that way, right? At least I do anyway. I always teach things, you know, it's black or it's white. And I do that because it's easier to teach that way and it's easier for people to understand it that way. The reality is that very few people in the world are going to be completely monochronic or completely polychronic, okay? But basically, monochronic orientation... Oh, and I'm also going to be biased because uh, I'm going to say one orientation is kind of the West, like... Canada, the United States, and Western Europe, and everyone else is the other one. And I know that's a gross exaggeration, just bear with me. So we talk about monochronic time orientation. I am totally a monochronic time orientation. If I tell you I'm going to be somewhere at 9 o'clock, I'll be there at 9, okay? Let me ask you this question. Let's say um, you uh, text your friend and you say, listen, let's go for coffee at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Who in this room, if it's at 2 o'clock, who will be there before 2? Really? No. You lie. Really? Okay. Before 2. Okay, fair enough. I'll believe you. How many people would be there more or less exactly at 2? 2 2.10. 2.20. Well, no, you can't do both. Are you there at 210 or 220? It depends on the boss. Okay. No, I'm not saying your boss. A friend. A friend. Oh, okay. No, but on average. Okay, where was I? I was at 220. Um, 230. No one. Okay. So I do, as I said, I do a lot of work in Zambia, in Africa. And when I do this and I say, who would be there before 2? The, there's only one hand that goes up, and it's mine. And then I say, who's going to be there at 2? And a few people will say 2. And then I'll say like 2.10, a couple more hands. Most people are coming around the 2.15, 2.20, around there, about 15, 20 minutes late. But they don't see it as being late. I do. That's my value judgment. I've placed that value judgment on them. They just say, well, no, it's, you know, 2, but 2.15, it's okay. We're all right. So that's, that's the time orientation. So I'm very monochronic in my time orientation. Those of you who said kind of 215, 220, we're not too worried about it, you're more polychronic, okay? Multiple times, right? So that's kind of what it's all about. Um, so as I said, blue kind of represents the West. We kind of stick to the clock. In the East, not so much. And as I said, it's, it's grossly simplified, oversimplified, but, but it's still 
it's, it's in indicative of what's going on. Um, I lived for three years uh, in Zimbabwe. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's a small country in southern Africa. And seriously polychronic culture. And so, for example, I lived in a really rural school. It was um, about 100 kilometers from the nearest city. There was really no road that went to the school, and I didn't have a car anyway. But there was one bus a day that would go to the school. And if you missed that bus, you didn't go to the school. I mean, we lived on campus. We lived at the school. But if I wanted to go into the city in order, in order to go into the city and go home, there was one bus a day. And if I missed it, well, I didn't go that day. So I can remember catching the bus, going to town, doing all my stuff, and then I went back to the bus depot to get the bus to go back to the school, and I saw a guy that I knew from the school, and I said, hey, what time does the bus leave? And he looked at me funny. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, what time does the bus leave? He said, well, it, he said, the bus is over there. I said, I know, I see the bus over there, and I could get on it, but I'm not going to get on it if the bus isn't going to leave. What time does the bus leave? He said, well, it leaves when the driver shows up. I said, well, what time's the driver showing up? He said, well, when the bus is full, the driver will show up and we'll go. And I said, when is that going to happen? He said, I don't know, in a couple of hours, whatever, I don't know. So you don't, there's no real schedule, right? It's very, very polychronic. Um, and it took me a long time to get used to that. And in fact, in some ways, I never really did get used to it. I would often hitchhike out to the school, and I had an agreement with the bus that if he saw me on the road, he'd stop and he'd pick me up. Because I just, I, I just couldn't get my head around this idea of, you know, we'll just hang out. We'll just hang out at the bus depot. It's outside. Um, I'm very white. I can't hang outside all day in the African sun. I'd burn to a crisp, right? So. I just, I would start hitchhiking and walking, and the driver, if he saw me, he'd pick me up. And, but I'll tell you, because of that attitude of mine, I got stranded many times. And you don't want to get stranded in the African bush at night, because you don't know what's in the bush. So it can be really scary. My headmaster and I used to joke about this a lot, and he had a lovely expression, which some of you may have heard. He always used to say, you know, you Canadian, you Western guys, you have the watch. I had always had a watch. He said, you have the watch, but the African man, we have the time. And I loved it because he's right. They were just very relaxed. Everything was okay. We don't know when the bus is going to go, but it's okay. Let's hang out. We're all together. We'll go have a beer. We'll have a Coke or something, and we'll chat. And I just thought that was lovely. I did eventually get used to it, but it was painful. Okay, so that's time orientation. This one you may not have heard of. Uh, it's called low context versus high context. Um, and it also is from Edward Hall, 1959. Now, I have to be really careful with this one because it can lead into stereotypes quite quickly, and I, and I apologize for that. But it's low context versus high context. Low I always hesitate to do this because I really can get into a lot of trouble. Low context cultures prefer direct communication. Okay? High, so that's the blue on the left. High context cultures, um, it, it's not always direct communication. So where we see this a lot is between the West and the East. Honestly, I also see this between men and women. Right? I hope you, this is where I get in trouble, but I gotta say it, right? Men tend to be very low context, right? We say what we mean, and we mean what we say. It's, it's simple, right? We're simple people. Women tend to have a lot of context. There's a lot of subtext. There's a lot of things that they're saying with their eyes that aren't coming out of their mouth. And it's important stuff. It's important, right? There's a lot of interpretation going on, right? So guys, listen to me carefully. When your female partner says, we have to talk, she's saying a lot more than she wants to talk about the weather. It's very indirect, okay? There's a lot of hidden meaning in that. When you say, guys, again, I'm talking to the guys, when you ask 
a woman how she's doing and she says fine, okay, she's fine. If she says fine, listen to the difference. There's fine and there's fine. Not the same thing. There's a lot of hidden meaning in that, right? And I know I'm, 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 being, I'm making a joke and so on. But there's a lot of hidden meaning, right? So there's this kind of direct, uh, direct kind of communication. And then there's high context communication. And where that shows up in the classroom is with things like assignments. And I'll give you lots of examples about this in a minute. But when I ask my students to write a paper, basically what I mean is write a paper that gives like, just answer the question. Introduction, topic one, topic two, topic three, conclusion, done. That's it. I don't want to hear about your vacation from last year. I don't want to know how the topic that I've given you is implicated in your grandmother's work. You know, I, it's, it's interesting, but that's not what I'm after. Whereas in low context societies, those types of added details are really important. They're absolutely critical, okay? So you just, you just need to be aware of those sorts of things. Okay, the other thing where this shows up is uh, not even with uh, assignments, but when you're in the classroom, right? So in a, in a low context culture, um, to have a student raise a hand and ask me a direct question or even challenge me, there's no problem with that, that's fine. In a high context culture, that would never happen because it's considered rude and it's considered uh, disrespectful to whoever it is as, is, is giving the lecture, right? So that's kind of where it, where it shows up. Okay. Whew. Nobody attacked me on that one. Good. That's, in some ways, that's the most dangerous one. There's another one that's called low power distance versus high power distance. And the way this uh, manifests itself is very similar to the previous one, but the context is different. So what happens in, in low power distances is you tend to have a more flat uh, hierarchy, right? So yes, I'm the lecturer, and yes, I'm up on stage, and I'm elevated you by, I don't know, half a meter or something, and yes, I have the microphone, and you guys don't. And yes, I'm controlling this. But relatively speaking, this is low context. In most contexts, if somebody wanted to raise their hand or stand up and challenge me on anything, you would feel relatively comfortable in doing that. Maybe not today because this is kind of a formal event, but in a regular class, probably most of you would be okay with that. So that's, that's low power distance, not a lot of levels of hierarchy. But there's high power distance. There's a lot of cultures, especially in the East, where you just do not question the authority of the person who's in the high power. And it's very clear who's in the high power position and who's in the low power position, and you don't question it, ever. And that shows up in the classroom by people not asking questions, not answering questions, even answering questions. I will ask questions, I'll ask students questions, you know, what do you think of whatever, and they, they will just look at me. And I know they know the answer, I know they have an opinion, but they will not share it because of this power thing, because I'm the prof. They won't do it. It can be really dangerous. There was a case uh, a few years ago, I should have checked the date. Um, who was it? It was Korean Airlines. There was an airplane that crashed, Korean Airlines plane that crashed, and some people died. Um, and when they did the investigation, what they found was that the pilot was consistently flying, like they were doing an approach to land, and he was coming in too fast and too low to make a safe landing. And so, of course, they hit the ground, and it was a crash, and people died. This wasn't that long ago. This was maybe five, ten years ago. When they did the investigation, the pilots survived. They talked to the, co to the pilot, and he said, well, you know, I did what I was trained to do. We did all the checklists and so on. When they talked to the co-pilot, they found out that the co-pilot knew that he was coming in too low and too fast, and he said nothing because low, high power context. You do not question the pilot. The pilot knows what he's doing, and people died, right? So since that time, airlines have changed the rules around this, and they've said, you know, the pilot needs to be part of that decision-making process on approach so that things like that won't happen. But imagine the story you're going to tell the loved ones of the people who died. Why did, why did my son die in this airplane crash? Because the co-pilot was afraid of the pilot. 
So from a from my perspective, from a low contact, uh, from a sorry low power distance point of view, that's pretty frightening. But it happens, and so we need to be we need to be um, sensitive to that. This one is quite a bit newer, and probably you're. I bet a lot of you are familiar with this one. Uh, individualism versus collectivism, uh, developed by Gert Hofstede in 1993. Uh, he proposed cultural dimensions, uh, quite a few of them, power distance, individualism, individualism versus collectivism, which is the one is here, uh, although his data actually goes back to the 60, 1960s and 70s. Um, and this is an interesting one. This one gets used a lot. Um, it gets used in sociology, it gets used in psychology, it gets used in theology. Uh, education, of course, communications, and so on. Um, it's a nice, compact theory, and it's pretty easy to understand, so people really like it. Uh, I've used it in, in, um, in my own work, in international relations, and so on, business, and so on. But anyway, uh, it's the idea that, um, it basically, it tries to answer the question that in a given society or in, or in a given context, what is most important, the individual or the collective? And you can, again, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you can come across stereotypical examples of this. So if you compare, for example, the United States versus China, the United States, if you were on that continuum of individual versus collective, they, they're really on the individual side, right? So this is where you run into things like um, they have the right to bear arms, even though it's a danger to society, that individual right to carry a gun is more important to them than the community right to safety. And you can make value judgments about that, whether you agree with it or not, and I make a value, I know where I stand on that question, but, uh, but as a society, you have to decide where you're gonna go with that. Whereas in China, and even in Canada, I'm not sure about Costa Rica, we're a little bit more on the community side, right? Public safety is usually more important than individual freedom. And it gets into some really, really interesting questions, right? So. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember traveling before 9-11, to get through an airport, yeah, you had to go through security, but it was relatively easy, you know, um, it wasn't a big deal. Since 9-11, particularly if you fly through the United States, the level of security is immense. And so what they've done is they've, they've decided that this whole individual rights thing and and public security, they've almost gone the other way. So this idea of, of public security and control is now more important than your individual rights in an airport, right? So those types of questions about individual versus communal, if you, if you remember this particular one, you'll, and then you watch the news and stuff, you'll start to see this pop up all the time, all the time. Okay. Um, make sure I didn't. Another example is, um, and this one's a little bit hard to follow, but in Japan, when a baby is born, they're actually seen, this is gonna sound funny, they're, sa they're seen as being very self-centered. Of course, they're newborn babies, right? But they're actually seen as being too self-centered. And so uh, the caring, in other words, they're only concerned about their immediate needs. Well, duh, they're a couple days old, right? Um, and so the up, but then the upbringing in Japan about that is about, uh, uh, processing and socializing this human being into a member of a family, community, and society at large. Okay, that's kind of the Japanese philosophy. So they're very communal, right? You have this individual that's very self-centered. Me, 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 everything is me. And the Japanese society says, that's too self-centered, let's make him part of the community. In the West, it's kind of the opposite, right? Or I should say, you know, in Canada and the United States. The baby is seen as too, in, as too dependent right? And the, so then the goal is, is to try to make them be more independent, right? So if you look at, again, I don't know what the Costa Rican context is, but in Canada and the United States, the goal when you're raising kids is, is to get them out of the house by the time they're 18, 19. Is that the same here? That's not like that here. You get to keep them, right? So the goal, and it's changing in Canada, to be honest. The kids are staying in the house longer and longer and longer. But when I was a kid, I moved out like three days after my 18th birthday, and to be, I, was, I think I was a pretty good kid, but I was the youngest kid, so my parents were real anxious to get me out of the house, and it was 
So I had just turned 18 and I was going off to university and it was sort of like, it's like, we'll miss you, we'll miss you. <laughs> uh, come back when you can't stay so long, um, that sort of thing. Um, it was all about kind of trying to get the kids out of the house uh, early. And, and again, I know I'm exaggerating, but. Uh, so we run into that in the classroom as well, because one of the things that's being emphasized in education more and more, as you probably know, is an emphasis on teamwork. This is showing up in research as well, by the way. I was saying to the, uh, to the group on Tuesday that if you look at a, at a um, if you just pick up any journal and you look at the table of contents, 10, 20 years ago, they would have all the articles listed and most of the articles would be written by one person. Now, that's actually rare. If you pick up a journal, you'll see all the titles listed. They're almost always written by multiple people, teams. Teamwork is more and more and more important all the time. So you have to consider when you're developing courses and when you're teaching, how does that gonna manifest, your, manifest itself in your classrooms? Are you going to have lots of individual assignments? Are you gonna have lots of team assignments? And if you have team assignments and your background culture is individualistic, how are you going to negotiate that with your students? So I run into this all the time because my students do a lot of teamwork. Many of them are Canadian. It's frustrating for them. They're not used to working in teams. They're not used to doing team kind of activities. And so what they immediately try to do is take the team activity, and say there's four people in the team, they'll take a team activity, they'll divide it into four, one, two, three, four, and they'll say, you do one, you do two, you do three, you do four, when you're done, we'll talk. That's not a team activity, that's four individual activities, right? And so I have to coach them through that process so that they understand that four individual activities does not equal a team activity. Right? So again, you, you, you probably, maybe you've already run into that in your classes. Okay. Another uh, cultural orientation, which is again a bit newer, um, by uh, Stella Ting Tumi, 1991. It's confrontation versus harmony, conflict styles. In in the West, in Canada and the United States, we're kind of confrontational, and I don't mean confrontational necessarily violently. But if I say something in class or in a lecture or in a meeting that people just think is outrageous and I'm not gonna give you an example, but if I say something that's outrageous, usually somebody will comment on it. They'll say, really? You really think that? Have you considered something else? You know, have you considered this other possibility? But they'll confront me on it, right? They'll challenge me. That's very much a, a kind of a confrontational Western way of looking at things. Most countries aren't like that. If you go to Asia in particular, but also most African countries, they won't confront you. It's about maintaining harmony. Maintaining the harmony is more important than being confrontational, okay? So, and again, you need to be aware of that in your classes. Okay. Just wanna make sure I don't. Uh There's uh, another one too, this, this will be the last orientation I do. Um, it's task versus relationship orientation. This one uh, is quite new, 2002, by Adler. Uh, it's depending on what you're gonna apply this to, in some ways this is the most powerful, it could be the most powerful orientation that I've gone through today. Uh, but it is a little bit hard to get your head around sometimes. But where it shows up a lot, again, is if you have your students doing teamwork, or if you yourself are involved in teamwork, okay? So one of the things I have to do, especially when I've got mixed teams, so I've got some Canadian students and some international students, is I have to coach them on this dimension. Because what happens is this, and I know, again, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I'll get a group, a team, say five, six people, some of them are Canadian, some of them are international, and I say, Here's your team assignment. What immediately happens is the Canadian students immediately want to get to the task. They'll say, okay, for this team assignment, clearly we need to do task one, task two, task three, task four. 
we need to do this, 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 very linearly, right? The Eastern students don't even, could you close that door, please? Thank you. Sorry, I know it's really hot, and we'll open up the doors again in a few minutes, but that's just too noisy. Um, so they're kind of linear in that way, but, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The international students, though, before they get to those tasks, they're more about relationships. So they will try to spend time getting to know each other. Who are you? What are your interests? You know, uh, what part of Asia or China are you from? It's about building relationships before you get to the tasks. Now, of course, that takes more time. And if you happen to be a monochronic time person, that's very uncomfortable. If you're a polychronic time person, it's probably okay, right? But it does, it takes more time. And so we get a lot of conflict at our university when we have mixed teams that way. Because half of the team will want to just get right to the tasks, and the other team just seems to be dilly-dallying and wasting time and, and you know, talking about relationships and so on, and it's a real problem. It was interesting, there was a case, this goes back about 20 years ago, and it wasn't in education, it was actually in business. Uh, and it was, a, it was a harsh lesson. So our Prime Minister at the time, Jean Chrétien, decided that uh, they wanted to expand Canadian uh, economic markets into China. And so he organized a huge group of uh, business people and government people to, to do a trade mission to China. And it was very diplomatic and so on. And the idea was that they, I think they were going to go for 10 days or 14 days or something like that. So the idea was that there was this huge trade mission. They were going to go to China. They were going to meet all the big government and business leaders in China. They were going to sign all these huge contracts, multilateral contracts, and then they were going to come back and we would have established business, business partnerships in China. So that's what they did. They went to China. They were there for 10 to 14 days, and they met all these people, and it was great and they only signed two contracts. And they were really angry because they said, we've come all this way, we brought gifts, everything was nice. Clearly, the business interests are obvious. You know, you need coal or you need oil and we've got a ton of oil. Why don't you want to, like, why wouldn't you sign a contract with us to buy our oil? You know, we have, we make trains and you guys clearly need trains. Why, what's the problem here? And so it took literally years for them to figure out that the problem was that Chinese don't do business that way. They have to build the relationships first. They're not just going to sign contracts with some guy that shows up from Canada. They need to build the relationships first, and it takes a long time. So now we actually have really good trade relationships with China, but it took 20 years, right? So it, th this, this kind of... Uh, cultural orientation. I, I really like this one, and it shows up a lot. Uh, and I use this uh, in the introduction. They said that I, I've been consulting since about 2003, and I had to learn this the hard way as well, because I would show up to businesses and so on, and, and clearly they needed my services, and I'd say, look, I know you need A, B, and C, and I can do A, B, and C, and then it wouldn't happen, right? And it's because I didn't have a relationship with those people. It's, it's a painful lesson, but, but a good one. So you need to know that. Uh, so it shows up in education, it shows up in my consulting practice, it shows up in business, it shows up in all kinds of interesting ways. So my advice to you on this is if things, if, you're, if you have, if sort of have a single-minded goal, whether it's in the classroom or whatever it is you're doing and it doesn't seem to be happening, turn it around, focus on the relationship, take a step back and say, well, maybe that person's just not ready yet. Let's just be more gentle. Let's try to get to know each other and so on. Okay? And, and it'll happen. You'll have success. It, but it takes longer. So a lot of people don't like that. Okay. I um, just want to make sure I'm not... I have a bunch of notes here. I want to make sure I'm not... Uh, yeah. Okay. just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. That's not me. Um, I did used to teach math. But never like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about what happens in the classroom. So, oh, sorry. There we go. So, the way I want to present this, 
and this might be a little bit different for some of you, is I want you to think about your classrooms as cultural spaces. And that might be a new idea, particularly if you're used to working in fairly homogenous environments. So, but if you can accept that, uh, at least for the rest of this discussion, hopefully we'll be able to pull it together at the end. So, but as I said before, I think, I think the classroom as a culture is something that we have all experienced, um, both as students and as, as instructors, right? Uh, I explained how we experience it as teachers, but we've probably experienced it as, as students as well. You know, we all have that kind of instructor that we click with, or if we're taking courses with other people and it's changing a little bit, sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. We, we rarely know why this is the case. It's a cultural thing, right? Uh, and you could probably investigate it and try to figure out why, but we don't usually bother doing that. But what I really want you to realize is that, uh, in addition to the classrooms, our classrooms don't exist in isolation. They really are kind of embedded in the politics and the social structures that we have and the cultural fabric of, of our institutions and our societies. Our classrooms are really, really connected, okay? We tend to forget that when we're in the classroom. We forget that our classrooms are cultures, but they are also connected to the cultures outside the classrooms, and that's really important. And there's different ways that you can think about this, right? So, actually, we ran into it this morning here. Think about your classroom, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, but in this case, face-to-face. -face. Think about the way the chairs are lined up, arranged. Think about the physical construction of the classroom, right? So in this case, this is clearly lecture. Everybody's pretty much looking at me. Uh, the tables actually shouldn't be here. It was meant to be like theater style rows. Um, there's no interaction going on here at all, but that's part of this culture, right? Um, and then at the end of the day, you have to ask the question, do I learn? Can I learn from this sort of physical environment? I was, when I taught math, I taught math for many, many years, and when I was living in Zimbabwe, that's what I was teaching. I was teaching math. And one day, depending on what I was teaching, depending on the topic, I would very often get my students to pull their desks together in small groups, kind of like what we have here, and then they could do math problems together and they could talk, and then I would just go and visit the tables. And I didn't think anything about that at all. And one day, my students were doing that, and I kind of stepped behind the door. I can't remember why, but I wasn't visible to the outside because the classrooms were kind of outdoor classes. While I was behind the door, the head of the math department came in to visit. He didn't see me. I didn't see him. My back was kind of to the door. He freaked out. He was mad. He thought the students were being very naughty. He yelled. He said, everybody, stand up.
demonstrating their learning by writing the ten page essay. Not everyone is good at demonstrating their learning by writing an exam. So you need to give those priorities. So what culturally what changes when you start to change the space? So I, I try and do that and I encourage you to do that as well. So in our case, when you're teaching online, you know it's the digital space that's our that's our classroom. So of course there's no chairs or tables or whiteboards, but we have digital tools, we have forms, we have blogs, we have videos. Get your students to make videos as an assignment, right? Get them to have fun and do things and, and then you're 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 starting to be more culturally sensitive and so on. Um, so anyway, um, let me just see here. Oh and uh, recognize also who is in your classroom, right? Again, my early teaching experiences were very homogenous. I would look out and I would see a bunch of white people all about the same age, a mix between, you know, sort of 50% male, 50% female, but they basically look the same. When I look out at my classes now, or if I check online, it's not the same at all. I have students as young as 20. Uh, I have students as old as 65 regularly. The oldest student I've ever had was 83 um, in a justice studies course, she was lovely. Um, so I have quite a variety. I have students with lots of different backgrounds. Some of them uh, have worked professionally for many, many years and they're coming back to school for a variety of reasons. Their motivations for coming back to school are different. Uh, I had one student, actually this, this almost makes me cry when I tell this, I'll try not to cry when I tell this story. I taught this course in basic adult then, this was a long time ago, and I had one guy show up who I kind of knew, not very well, but I kind of knew who he was, and I asked him, why are you here? And he said, well, mostly I just want to learn how to read. And I went, well, this is a guy who was like 60 years old. And I, and he didn't, I knew he worked for the railway, and I knew he had an amazing job, and he made really good money, and he was close to retirement. And he said, so what do you do here? He said, I want to learn how to read. And I went, what? By the way, this is the only time I've ever made a student cry by telling this story, and I don't want to cry. I said, you're, you're 60, right? Yeah. And you got, you're making lots of money, and you're about to retire. Why is learning how to read important to you? And what I was thinking was he was going to say something like, well, I'd like to be able to read the newspaper. He was completely illiterate. I want to learn how to read the newspaper. That's what I was expecting. What he said was, my daughter just had a son. I want to read. I want to learn to read to my grandson. That's what he said. And I just thought, wow, that's amazing, right? Who in the year 1986, which is when I started in this thing, who would have thought of that? I don't think that would have happened. But in the year, when, whenever that was, the year 2000, I guess, uh, that wasn't unusual, right? So for him, it was about being able to have a different relationship with his new grandchild. So amazingly powerful stories. Find out what those student stories are, and you'll be impressed, I guarantee. I guarantee it. Okay. So our classrooms, again, this, this makes way more sense in the Canadian class. How many of you have ever actually seen an iceberg? Yeah, only me. So when you study an iceberg, people don't realize this. This piece that's up on top here is absolutely huge. I mean, it's bigger than this building, some icebergs. They're absolutely massive. But what they don't realize is that the part that's underneath is actually much bigger. And it has to be bigger because if it's not, it'll flip over or it'll fall on its side. So the weight underneath is actually way more. And that's true of culture as well. What we see on the surface is that it looks big, and, it's, and it is, and it looks amazing, but it's tiny in comparison to what's going on underneath, underneath the surface. Okay, so we need to be aware of that. So behaviors are visible, usually, uh, but the underlying thinking is not visible, right? And so we often don't know what's going on. Uh, so I really like the iceberg as a metaphor. The other one uh, that I like, I don't have a picture of it, is a duck. You guys have ducks, and you watch them swimming across the pond, and, it's, and they look very calm, and they're just kind of gliding, and it looks really easy. But if you look under the surface, their legs are going <laughs> crazy, right? But you don't see any of that on top of the surface. Everything just looks very kind of zen-like, right? It looks very easy. So that's another analogy that you could think of. What's going on underneath is way more than what's going on on top, okay? So you think about this in a cultural context, what that means is that, you know, that tip, that part on the top is supported by a much larger foundation, and that foundation is our beliefs, our values, our worldviews, uh, our cultural backgrounds, and so on. And they're deep. 
It's really hard to even understand them, they're so deep. It's hard to identify them, they're so deep. I said earlier that I'm very much a monochronic kind of person. Why? I don't know why. I, it would take forever to try and figure out why. I mean, yeah, okay, I'm Canadian, my parents were probably monochronic and so on. But to actually try to figure that out is not easy, right? And, and that type of thinking, of course, is influenced um, by what happened in the past, but also by what's going on now. It's influenced by our environment and so on. So anyway, so I just, I really like that. Um, I, re I really like that analogy. And so in terms of, uh, you know, what's going on underneath the different things, I just mentioned a couple, there's age, right? There's ethnicity, gender, language proficiency, and so on. Uh, experience and education, communication styles, I mean, this list could go on.
percent plagiarized. And they don't mean it as plagiarism. They don't see it as plagiarism. And so I'm not suggesting you accept that. In fact, don't. Don't accept that because it is plagiarism. That's completely unethical in my view. What I am suggesting is, is that you need to have a conversation with those students and explain to them why that approach doesn't work and what is the better approach. And we, I explained what the better approach is before, which is you need to talk to those students. You need to say, fine, you use other people's works, but it has to be mostly your work if you're writing an essay or something. It has to be mostly yours. You can refer to other works. You can quote other works. You can paraphrase other works, but it has to be essentially your work. Okay. This doesn't pull in. Ah, there we go. Um, let me just see. Yeah, no. Again, I want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Yeah. Okay. So another way, um, this is kind of more on the learning side of things. Uh, in the West, we tend to place greater emphasis on self-directed learning. Uh, Actually, I have a, a real problem with this with my new grad students um, because in undergrad, we're very much used to uh, being very explicit about our assignments. You know, write an assignment to describe um, the political implications of Donald Trump, right? And, and, and we expect them to kind of do it linearly. There'll be an introduction, there'll be topic one, topic two, topic three, and then a conclusion, and that's kind of how we see it. Um, a lot of people from different cultures have a really hard time with that uh, because they expect uh, us to be way more prescriptive in the assignments. In other words, what is it about Donald Trump that you want me to talk about, right? Whereas in the West, we're kind of used to saying, well, you, you decide, go ahead. I run into this to, with graduate students too because they are used to that kind of prescriptive way of learning and they get into graduate school and they're not used to being independent. And so I have to, and they don't like it. And I say to them all the time, they'll say, well, should I do my essay like this or should I do it like that? And my response is always, you're a grad student. You decide and then you submit it. And they're very uncomfortable with that because they think that I'm just playing games with them and then I'm gonna punish them somehow. Um, but it's, that's not the way it is, right? Um, we expect a lot of active participation. Um, that doesn't happen in a lot of cultures. There's an emphasis on integration of knowledge, application of knowledge, uh, whereas in many other cultures, there's an emphasis on memorization. Back to my experience in Zimbabwe, as I said, I was teaching math there. And the way it works there is they do a two-year program of study. Uh, their high school is divided into two-year blocks. And I can give them tests while I'm teaching them, but it doesn't count. Their grade is 100% based on a final exam, which I do not set and I do not mark. It actually came from England. So they would send exam, and this is hard to believe, they would send exams from England to Zimbabwe under lock and key with a literal security guard. And then I, I, we were allowed to supervise the exams, but we weren't allowed to see them ahead of time. The students obviously weren't allowed to see them ahead of time. They would write this exam and that was 100% of their mark. So if they passed the exam, they passed the course. If they failed the exam, they failed the course. That was it. And that's what they were used to. And it was this huge emphasis on memorization. So they would get examples of past exams and memorize the questions because they knew the new questions were gonna be similar and that's how they would pass. But they weren't able to transfer that learning at all. You might see this in some of your students. They can, if you ask them very direct questions, they can answer them, but they can't apply it. I'll give you an example. So I had one student, we became friends. He studied in the Zimbabwean system and then became a math teacher in Zimbabwe. And I got a hold of a past exam that had this uh, qu a math question in something called differential equations. Don't worry if you know what that, don't know what that is. And the application was chemistry. So it was a math question in chemistry, and honestly, I couldn't do it. I was stumped. So I went to my friend George, who was just down the hall, and I said, George, I don't have a clue how to do this question. Can you show me? And he looked at it and he goes, oh yeah, I remember this question. And he showed me how to do it. And then I looked at it and I went, oh yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. So then I went and I taught it. The next day, because I'm a difficult person, I rewrote the question. Same numbers, same equations, everything. The difference was, instead of chemistry, it was economics. And I said, George, 
I'm really sorry to bug you. Can you help me again on this other question? I showed it to him. He goes, oh, I, I, don't, I don't recognize this. And he sat down. He, he couldn't do it. It was the same question. It was exactly the same. But because he had learned through memorization, he hadn't learned to apply knowledge even within our own discipline, let alone through other disciplines. And so that's a real challenge. And we're trying to get, we're, you know, in the West, we're trying to improve that, I think. But in lots of other uh, cultures, uh, we're, not, we're not there yet. Okay. So um, there's another thing. I don't know if, is there anybody, I'm just curious, is there anybody in the room that sort of has a background in either instructional design or curriculum design? Like, and by background, I mean, maybe you've taken a course or something. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so not very many of us. So, well then let me ask the question in a slightly different way. How many of you have heard of uh, learning taxonomies, particularly things like Benjamin Bloom? Bloom's taxonomy, that sort of stuff. Okay, so a few more of you, right? So I'm a kind of a fan of Benjamin Bloom, even though his material is pretty old. It's from the 1950s. But if you look at instructional design materials, you find that his materials, his theories are still being used quite a lot. And even though, you know, it's been 60 years. And the way he has it set up is that uh, lower or, I'll do it over here, lower order things are like memorization. And then when you get to the top, it's things like critical thinking, application, that sort of stuff. And that's the way it, it's, it's set up. And, uh, and we, we just accept that in the West. And yet when you go to other um, cultures, sometimes this falls on its, on its face. So for example, one time I was designing a course and I was using a, a public office just for associate faculty. So people were coming in and going out all the time. And I, I had Bloom's taxonomy kind of just printed out and taped on the wall beside my computer and I was designing a course kind of looking at that. Which verbs am I going to use? Which objectives am I, going to, am I going to use? And that sort of stuff. And I had Bloom's taxonomy. And a colleague of mine who's uh, Canadian First Nations, so an Aboriginal fellow, uh, he walked by and he's also, in addition to being First Nations fellow, his area is applied linguistics and he's, so he's done lots and lots of work around language acquisition and so on, primarily with Canada's indigenous communities. And he looked at my stuff and he said, you know, do you realize this is very culturally biased? And I was mad, I have to admit, because, you know, here I was the, the intercultural expert for the university and I thought I knew it all. And I thought I was Mr. Intercultural Sensitive Guy. And he walked behind me. Within 10 seconds, he destroyed work that I had been doing for years. So, but we're still friends. We're still friends. He's a nice guy. But anyway, he said, do you realize this is, ab this is, this is really culturally biased? Because when you're working with aboriginals, memorization and comprehension are very, very highly valued. And in the model that I was using, it was almost dismissed. When you reach especially higher level university courses, we don't do a lot of memorization anymore because we don't think it's a good skill. And yet, in First Nations and Aboriginal communities, it's still considered very, very important. And I missed that completely. So thanks to him for pointing that out to me. And fortunately, he was really polite and everything. But, but I, I have to admit, I, I felt really stupid for a while. Um, but anyway, so, so I always tell that story because even though these accepted kind of norms, they can change from culture to culture. So you need to be aware of that. Okay. Because of the nature of the courses I teach, there's a lot of emphasis on writing. I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, this particular slide, but it just kind of summarizes different, different types of writing orientations that you may run across if you're working in intercultural environments. So just be aware of that. Um, obviously, you know, my bias is to the one that's furthest on the left there, the English one. I'm very used to kind of a linear style of thinking. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, but as, as instructors, that's not what you're going to run into all the time, okay? You're going to run into different types of writings. Some are very circular, some to seem to take a long time to get to the point, uh, and so on. So just be aware of that. Um, so like I said, if you think about, and again, I'm not sure this happens in the Costa Rican context, but I suspect it does. If you give a student an assignment to write, an, uh, like an essay to write, usually it's fairly linear. Right? You give them a topic or you ask them to choose a topic and the essays more or less look the same. You're going to have an introduction, you're going to have topic one, topic two, topic three, conclusion, references, done. Am I correct in that? Is that kind of the Costa Rican way of doing things as well? Yeah. I mean, in Canada, that's, that's like 90% of the essays, if not more, right? 
But that's not the only way to do an essay, and so you need to be aware of that. So you either need to be open to other styles of writing essays, or if you're insisting on this linear one, you need to be very explicit with your students that that's what you want. The other thing you need to do, be very explicit about, and this applies to all students, not just international students, you have to be really explicit about what you mean in terms of your assignment. I gave an assignment last year, I was teaching a research methods course, where I asked uh, students to choose a, a research article uh, in the field of justice studies, because that, that was our program, and they had to critique the article. And I even gave them an example of what I meant by a critique so they could check. And yet there were still a few students in that course that didn't understand what I meant by a critique. Some of them thought I meant uh, to do a summary. Some of them thought that I meant that I should take that article and build other articles around it. And when you do that, basically what you end up with is a literature review. So what I asked for was a critique, and what I got was a summary. Not all of them, most of them got it, but there were still a few. I got summaries and I got literature reviews from that, right? So that's my fault, because I was not explicit enough about what I meant in that assignment. So the next time I teach that course, I'll be a little bit more careful. Okay, so that's on the, kind of on the student side um, and on the teaching side. Um, there's another resource uh, that I have up there. It's Jude Carroll and Janet Ryan. This is quite recent, 2000, well, recent, 2005. Um, this is, for me, this is fairly new. Uh, it's an interesting, they call it a theoretical framework. I hesitate to call it a theoretical framework because I don't think you can really use it in, teach, uh, in, uh, in research, but, or even in teaching. Like, you can't really design your course using this framework but it is an interesting way of thinking about your students and the way you're developing curriculum and so on. So basically um, what they say, let's go this way. Uh, well, I'll, actually I'll just, I'll just go to the next slide. So the idea is that there's kind of four dimensions with your students. There's deficiency, asset, and then survive and thrive. And I'll give you some examples of what could or should go into each of those dimensions. So on the deficiency side, if you kind of have a deficiency mindset when you've got intercultural students coming in, uh, we tend to worry, as I said right at the beginning of the lecture, that you know they lack critical thinking. We worry about that. Like, and in fact, some professors are not that polite. Right? They say different things about the students. But basically, the students come in and they just don't think they're ready. They're not. They're not up to scratch. But usually they'll say they lack critical thinking. Whereas I hope, I hope you understand, either from your own experience or from today's lecture, that it might not be a lack of critical thinking. It might be a language issue. It might be a cultural issue. It might be something else entirely. But it might be a lack of critical thinking skills too. Deficiency, oh, we have a plagiarizer here. Maybe you might but it might not be that at all. It might be a different cultural orientation, right? So again, we need to be aware of that. We have a rote learner. In other words, they, they insist on just memorizing everything. Again, that might be true, but be aware it might not be true. So don't be afraid to dig and ask the students and go and talk to them and find out what's going on. Why is it they feel they need to just um, repeat whatever it is you say? Why is it they seem to have an overemphasis on memorization and rote learning? What's going on there? They seem to be pretty good speaking and writing, not bad, but lots and lots of grammatical errors. Again, in a homogenous society, in a homogenous classroom, in the past, the way we, at least the way I would treat that is I would say, look, this person shouldn't be in a first year or second year university classroom. And I might even fail them. I, I would never actually did that. I would go and talk to them and I would say, look, you've got to get your act together. You need to go and get an editor or you need to work with the writing center or you need to do something because I'm not going to accept this. So as departments and as, as individual instructors, you need to start having conversations around this about the relative importance. And this is going to change, just so you know. You're not going to sit down today and come up with a single answer to this question that's going to last for the next 10 years. Uh-uh. It changes all the time. It's going to depend on which course you're teaching, what level the course is. When I get first-year students coming in, I'm a lot more forgiving 
than I am when I have fourth year students coming in. And this shocks some of my students because I teach two courses, history and philosophy. They're two part courses, part one, part two. The problem is part one is in third year and part two is in fourth year. So I get students doing stuff in third year and I'll, I'll let some things go. I'll comment on it, but I won't take grades off. And then they get into fourth year and they do the same thing and I take grades off and they get mad. And I tell them, this is a fourth year course. The standard is higher. I warned you the standard was gonna be higher and I was gonna be expecting more from you. So, and, but anyway, those are, sorry, those are conversations you're gonna have to have amongst yourselves and see where you want those standards to be and it's gonna change. But, but the underlying question is, if you have students that seem to be okay, you know, they're not, they seem pretty smart and everything, but when they communicate, either through speaking or writing, they seem to make a lot of mistakes. So what is the underlying, you don't have to have a conversation. What is the underlying cause of that? How important is that for you? Uh, does that really affect their learning? You know, are you willing to pass somebody if they're not able, in your case, to communicate correctly in Spanish? Um, so those are the types of conversations you're going to have to have. And the, by the way, they're not easy conversations, and they take a long time, just so you know. There's, a, there's an assumption behind all of that that clumsy language equals clumsy thinking. And I'm guilty of saying that, right? If you can't communicate, in my case, in English or in French, then your thoughts aren't clear. Uh, I'm not sure that's true anymore. Um, but again, that's a conversation you have to have within your departments and decide where you want to draw that line. Okay, so that's kind of the deficiency way of looking at it, but there's an asset way of looking at it, and I like this one. A lot of the students, if you're getting students coming from other countries, and this is especially true in the Canadian context, and this is going to sound really awful, but it, it sounds like I'm insulting them, but I'm actually complimenting them. The students we get, say, from Saudi Arabia and China and so on, these are not the dumb students from China. The very fact that they've been able to learn English in a couple of months and they've got the, the strength and the motivation to leave China and come to Canada on their own and start a new life and study in a language that they've only been learning for a few months. Like these people need a big pat on the back. Like I think they're amazing, amazing people. And they may, in fact, that likely they were good or exceptional students in their home countries. And we often in the Canadian context don't acknowledge that. And that's, that's really unfortunate. But we also have to recognize that a lot of these students are gonna have to make extra efforts to upgrade their languages and we have to provide the facilities for that. And at my university, we, we are pretty good about that. There's a few things that we don't do very well, uh, but we're, we're not bad at it. I just said this one, they, they have an aspiration and courage to study abroad. That alone, to me, carries a lot of weight. That's a huge asset. You can use that in your classrooms you can use their knowledge. You can ask them questions. So one thing that I will do, and it's, this is quite interesting. So I, I teach a graduate course in international relations, and about 60% of my students are from uh, mainland China, and the other 40% are from everywhere. And when we're coming into particular terms that they may not know, like globalization, for example, I'll do a unit on globalization and I'll start by saying, well, what is globalization? And we'll kind of give a definition. And when we get the definition done, I'll always ask the students whose first language is not English to take their phones, put in globalization into their translator and tell me what it is in their home language, Chinese, Japanese, whatever it is, and then read it out loud so everyone can hear, and then take that word and put it back into their translator and have it translated back into English and see what you get. And you get some very interesting results when you do that, okay? Um, globalization, for example, when I, I remember when we did that in, in, um, in Chinese, put globalization in the translator, it pops out in Chinese. I don't speak Chinese. I don't know what it came out as, some long, I think, I remember I counted the characters though. It was about four characters. So one word translated into four characters, which was interesting. Because the more characters, the more complex the idea is basically. So translated into four characters. Then I said, okay, take those four characters, put them back into your translator, tell me what it comes up in English. 
And it was interesting because when it came back into English, the focus was 100% on economic trade. And globalization is far bigger than economic trade. It includes culture, it includes, it includes uh, communications, it includes technology, and it includes economic trade. That is certainly a part of it. But when it translated back, it was only about international trade. That was interesting. We had a really interesting discussion about that, about the emphasis on that context. So anyway, all that to say that, that these international students and intercultural students, they bring stuff with them that you may not be aware of, and you need to figure out ways that you can draw them out and draw those things out. So for me, allowing the students to use their translators in and on their phones in the classroom was a big way of helping them to relax and helping them to see ways that they could use uh, these types of things in the classroom. And then the whole class benefited because the fact that when the Chinese came back talking about international trade, that led to a discussion for the whole class about how important is international trade in the context of globalization. Turns out it's very important, right? And we may not have been able to have that discussion otherwise. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I talk too much. Okay. Cultural knowledge, I just kind of talked about that one as well. They bring a lot of cultural knowledge. If you can incorporate that into your classrooms, do it. It will benefit everybody. This is the other thing that I always emphasize. Uh, any changes that you can make, any ways that you can be more intercultural, uh, they don't just benefit the people from the different cultures, they benefit the domestic students as well. So last night, I was walking around downtown. I was going to point this out, but I forgot. You know when you walk on the sidewalk and you get to the end of the sidewalk? I haven't seen this everywhere, but you get to the end of the sidewalk and the curb disappears and there's like a little ramp you guys I don't there's probably a name for that I don't know what the name is but there's that little ramp down there why was that put there what's the ramp for it's for people who are in wheelchairs right or maybe canes or walkers and stuff that it, that's who it was put there for guess what that benefits me too right so they did not put those ramps in there for me they were not thinking about you know a 50 year old white guy they were thinking about people in wheelchairs. But I'll tell you, I really like it. If I'm walking around and I'm crossing the street, like I'm a bit of a klutz and it's at night and sometimes I need glasses and sometimes I don't. If that thing's not there, guess what? 50% of the time I'm gonna trip over it. But with a ramp, I don't trip, right? Or if I'm carrying something or if I'm pulling something or if I have a bicycle. So it wasn't put there for me, but I really benefit from it. Same thing with incorporating these intercultural ideas, right? You're kind of doing it for your intercultural students, your international students, people from different cultures. That's kind of why you're doing it. I guarantee you everyone will benefit from it. All of your domestic students will benefit from it. You will benefit from it. Your colleagues will benefit from it. So because, and that's largely because they bring a lot of uh, cultural knowledge with them. Uh, and then of course that, it, it grows. It creates a capacity to expand their cultural ways of learning, but yours too. Right, so it's very, very powerful. Okay, let's talk about some strategies for teachers. Uh, again, this is a little bit of, a, of an example. This, and this is still on the, on the current theory about uh, assets def deficiencies and so on. So this is the survive and thrive. So uh, when you're in a class, there are days I know when it's hot and really all you wanna do is survive. <laughs> I just wanna get through, just let me get through this. Let me get to four o'clock so I can go home and have a glass of wine or a beer. I get it, I know that. But whenever possible, try to thrive as well. So to survive, think about more about critical reflection, both in your teaching and get the students to critically reflect as well. I'm looking at you guys, I know that you're all doing preschool and this, that part of it might seem really silly. How am I gonna get a five-year-old or a four-year-old to critically reflect? You can. It's called auto-evaluation, and what you do is, have you guys seen this before? Do you guys do this with your students? You can actually get them, and there's a simple little statement, and at the end there's a smile and a frown, and you get them to circle one. So do you think you did it, you know, so today you were, uh, sorry, I don't know anything about preschool, but today you were making um, uh, little things to celebrate mom, your mom, for Mother's Day, right? And then at the end of the exercise, you can say, uh, 
you know, I did a good, uh, again, I'm making this up. I did a good job, or I feel like I did a good job coloring. Smile, frown. I guess you'd want to have a neutral one too, right? So you can get even the littlest students, littlest students, smallest students, smallest kids, sorry, I'm losing my English, youngest students to do this kind of auto-evaluation, to do this self-reflection, all the way up to PhD students. Self-reflection is very, very important. That's how we progress. That's how we, dis that's how we advance ourselves, okay? Uh, but if you want to thrive, you can take that a step further and you can examine cultural differences with cultural reflection. Why do you think you did badly in this exercise? What was the problem? Could we have set this exercise up in a different way that would have met your needs better? How do you think you did on this teamwork assignment? Good, bad, neutral, why? How could we have improved that? What could we have changed, right? So these types of self-reflection exercises are really, really important. The problem is, there's two problems with it, though, that I'll warn you. Number one, they take a lot of time. And some people don't like that, especially if you're a linear kind of uh, monochronic person like me. People don't want to do time on that. Uh, the other thing is, is most of your students you're going to see are not used to doing critical for reflection. They don't really understand how to do it. They don't really see the value in it. And so you have to really coach them on that, which, of course, takes time as well. So those, that's the only two drawbacks with it. Uh, it does require an investment in time. On the research side, I know there's some research people here, and, I, and I'm mostly focusing on teaching for this. Sorry, I'm looking at that now. Okay. Um, so um, on the research side, same thing. Make sure, actually, I think researchers are actually better at this than teachers, honestly. But this whole self-reflection peer review piece, don't forget it, okay? Okay. Uh, I've been told that uh, if we want to get to questions, I should go a little faster. So, um, and you'll have access to this as well. So these are just kind of more and more examples, okay? Um, okay. So more strategies for students. Uh, learn about cultural differences, how to learn and adapt and negotiate their learning. And these are things that you're, go as instructors, you're going to foster and develop in your, in your students. Uh, learn how to build on their strengths. We talked about that already. Learn how to cross cultures and become intercultural. So in your case, uh, you're, everyone in this room is well on your way to being intercultural if you weren't already intercultural before coming in here, right? This is a huge step, not just because you're listening to me. That's actually a very small part of it, but because you're in here together with a shared interest, and I'm hoping that through the questions at the end and those of you who will stay for the workshop, you're going to continue this conversation. And then at the end, after today, that you're going to even continue that conversation with each other and maybe bring me into some of those conversations. I would really be honored if you did that. So, but don't forget that each, this is more for the teachers, don't forget that each one of us has culture and there is a classroom culture. We joke in Canada that we're so multicultural that we don't have a culture. Uh, so when I travel in Africa, the question I often get is, what is the staple food in Canada? What is the staple food of Costa Rica? I didn't hear it louder. There you go, rice and beans. Staple food in China, if you're in the north, it's wheat. If you're in the south, it's rice. Staple food of Canada, I don't know, moose? I, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know that we have one, right? Like maple syrup. Maple syrup. There you go. See? I need to come to Costa Rica to learn about my culture. <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that oftentimes that culture is very much under the surface and you don't know what it is. And sometimes you really have to dig. And sometimes someone else has to tell you. Um, I get, because I've worked so much in Zimbabwe and Zambia, my Zimbabwe friends often say to me, and sometimes they say this nicely, and sometimes it's a little bit chilling. But they say to me, you know, you know Zimbabwe too well. And it's because I lived there, and I got to travel in ways and places that they never would go, and so on. And I've been studying it for 30 years. So um, anyway, so but everyone has a culture. There is a classroom culture. It's a question of how you understand it and how you work with it, right? Uh, and we can use pedagogy to recognize those assets and maybe focus on the assets rather than deficiencies. And as I said before, it'll benefit all students. Talk a little bit about uh, how we do it at the university where I teach, which is Royal Roads. As I said, we're a very small university, uh, but we have a lot of international students, so it's a big deal for us. 
we, our curriculum hasn't really changed that much, but the way we do our curriculum has. So we're still using a lot of Western-centric theories and perspectives, but we've changed our academic writing a little bit to accommodate different cultures. In my case, because I also teach philosophy courses, I do try to change uh, some of my curriculum, and that's a personal interest. So I'll do Western philosophers, I'll do Plato and Hobbes and all those guys, but I'll also try to bring in some African philosophers and some Indian philosophers, Tagore and that sort of stuff, uh, even Confucius and so on. I'll try and bring those in as well. Um, not everyone does that, but it's important for me to do that, so I do that. Uh, the pedagogy, we've changed a lot of our class discussions. We've import, we've, we're, we have a mandate, it's actually a university-wide mandate that, e and I disagree with this mandate, but every class taught at our university, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, must have at least one team assignment. And I hate rules like that because it's just too general, but that's the way it is. And so we've had to change that, the way that we're doing team assignments because we now have lots of international students. And we've had to rethink this next part about individualist orientations toward uh, versus teamwork. How are you going to set those up? We've always, up until 2012, we always had native English fluency as our standard. If you can't function at a very, very high level in English, both spoken and written, then you're not going to pass our courses. We've had to rethink that. Not necessarily drop our standards, but we have had to re-examine what portion of our grade, essentially, is going to be for that. For me, depending on what level, I'll tell you, uh, in order to, to get an A in our university, you have to have an 80% or above. So A range grade is 80% and above. The way I explain it to my students is, at the beginning of the course, you have a list of goals that I have for the course and objectives. If you meet those goals and objectives, you do not get an A. You get a B range grade, which is between 70 and 80%. If you want an A range grade, you have to go beyond that, and that includes your English writing and your APA formatting, we're standard on APA formatting, has to be basically perfect. And that's what I tell them, and they know that on day one, and I emphasize that I tell them that almost every single day. If you do, and they, they think, some of them think it's unfair, because what I'm basically saying is, if you do what I ask you to do, you're getting a B. And they think if, you, if they do what I ask them to do, they should get an A. So that's kind of where it, where it happens. So again, you'll have to have that conversation here about where you want that to go. Integration, uh, internship preparation. So we have students, international students, doing internships within the university and outside. That's to get them used to working and living in the community and so on. Uh, we get them to participate in different ways because some of them aren't used to writing in English. So I'll get them to do journals, blogs, uh, videos, that sort of stuff, just to try to capitalize on their skill sets. Uh, again, intercultural teamwork. We actually have team coaching staff now at university. That's their full-time job, is they are team coaches, and they're assigned to different departments. So last, I was te that same research methods course that I was teaching, I had one team that was completely dysfunctional. It was online, and I brought in a team coach, and we kind of resolved what was going on through the team coach. Okay, uh, Assessment I talked about already. We also have study skills workshops that we do. Uh, again, mostly for international students so that they can incorporate into the university a little bit better. We do team workshops, faculty workshops. Actually, I do a lot of those faculty workshops myself, just like what I'm doing here. Uh, and we have a lot of student support to address conflicts, cultural sensitivities, that sort of stuff. Okay. I'm going to finish with my favorite quote of all time. This fellow just died a few years ago. He was in his 90s. Alvin Toffler, he was a futurist. I should actually hide this. This is an amazing quote. The illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who cannot read and write. The illiterate of the 21st century will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now that's an amazing quote, and it's, it's amazingly accurate. As educators, as scholars, we do this on a daily basis. We should, anyway, be questioning our understanding of things and as fact a few years ago, particularly in social sciences and cultural issues, may or may not be true today, and we need to be examining that on a daily basis. To make this even more amazing, though, and a lot of this has to do with globalization and technology, to make this even more amazing, though, is he, this quote is from 1970. Most of us in this room weren't even born in 1970. 
right? And he made this quote in 1970. This is amazing. So he was a real amazing futurist. Uh, anyway, okay. So I'm going to park it there. If this will come up. There we go. So thank you. And we have time for questions. And again, being intercultural, if I could get those four books to come back, maybe I'm going to have to force someone. We've got time for questions. And I know people are always shy about asking questions. You can ask them in Spanish. Maynard's going to circulate a microphone, which sounds like it's not working. Um, you can ask them in English. You can ask them in Spanish. I do have a translator. I'll put in my ear in a minute. Uh, to encourage participation, Maynard, this, you're going to get accosted now. Just be ready. To encourage participation, the first four questions will get one of the books. How's that? Okay. Can I ask the books to come up? Yeah, I want them to come up. Okay. Si alguno tiene una pregunta. Buenos días. Buenos días. Primero, aquí estoy. <risa> Agradecerle la presentación, la exposición. En realidad el tema de cultura y de interculturalidad es eh, poco abordado en muchos de los espacios. En los últimos años ha sido un tema que se considera en mayor, en mayor profundidad y, y en algunos contextos educativos ha sido olvidado como uno de los elementos cruciales para el éxito del, del estudiantado e incluso del, de los profesores, los docentes que participan en un ambiente de aprendizaje. Yo me perdí parte de la exposición porque tuve que salir a atender un asunto, entonces eh, no quisiera irme sin conocer cuál es el, su definición de cultura. Porque a partir de la definición que tengamos de cultura, así van a ser nuestras propuestas ¿verdad? de desarrollo en diferentes ámbitos. Y lo segundo es, eh, hay una tendencia por confundir un espacio intercultural o internacional. Eh, por ejemplo, un plan de estudios es internacional porque agrupa personas con diferentes nacionalidades. Frente a una concepción de una internacionalidad en un plan de estudios porque tiene un abordaje curricular y de contenido bajo esa visión de internacional. En educación a distancia eh, y en entornos virtuales o en línea, eh, se propicia esa participación de personas de diferentes países, pero eso no quiere decir que un plan de estudios o que un, un proceso educativo sea internacional. Entonces, quisiera conocer su posición al respecto. También la interculturalidad, por ejemplo, se sabe, al igual que Canadá, Costa Rica es un país multicultural y multilingüe y a veces pensamos que este, no lo tenemos eh, en el mismo país, en este pequeño territorio. Cuando usted preguntó cuál era la comida, alguien dijo rice and beans, rice and beans. Entonces yo me quedé pensando, ¿qué estamos pensando todos los que estamos aquí? ¿Nos imaginamos un rico raizandín caribeño o estamos pensando en un plato de arroz y frijoles? ¿Verdad? Entonces, ya desde ahí estamos viendo la interculturalidad en este pequeño. ¿Cuáles son nuestros referentes? Eh, porque en, es, en, en Costa Rica lo que decimos en Cartago a veces no nos entienden en Guanacaste y viceversa. Entonces, no, no pensemos únicamente en esos espacios en que se reúnen, sino que en nuestras, en nuestras mesas de trabajo... El, el lugar de donde vivimos lo traemos con nosotros y es nuestro referente de aprendizaje. Gracias. Good, thank you. Um, I think the answer to my first question will actually 
answer your other question as well. And I put up this slide. Uh, I did define culture fairly early in the presentation, so I guess you missed it. But it, if you accept this, at that either it's a system of shared meaning or it's kind of an implicit theory that a group of people uh, accept and, are ki and kind of have in common, it's sort of a general definition. Uh, and on its own, honestly, it's not really that useful. Um, but when you start to operationalize this definition, then it becomes very useful. And I think it'll answer your second question. So if you accept this, that it's a system of shared meaning, what that leads to is that culture includes the things that we normally think of, like food, uh, language, music, writing, that sort of stuff. But it also expands out to include things like gender, um, physical abilities, mental abilities, uh, cultural, uh, not cultural, um, education backgrounds, class, like uh, how much money do you have, that sort of stuff. All of those things given a different context can be a culture. And so that kind of speaks to some of, the, some of the other stuff that you were talking about in your second question, I think. And if not, please uh, ask again, otherwise I misunderstood it. Is that okay? I hope, I hope that's okay. Another Hola. question. Hola. <laughs> este... Vamos a ver, eh, hay autores que refieren eh, que es muy importante en el trabajo desde la interculturalidad uh, el conocer mi propia identidad y el trabajar sobre quién soy yo para poder entender al otro, ¿verdad? Y hacerlo parte de, de mí. Y es parte, uh -huh. digamos, de las estrategias que se utilizan para eliminar precisamente esas barreras que hay eh, entre cada uno de nosotros. Coincido con Jenny en el sentido de que aquí mismo, o sea, si nos, si nos vemos cada uno de nosotros, cada uno de nosotros trae un bagaje, ¿verdad? Y, y que nos hace diferentes, que no necesariamente coincido en eso, que tengo que ser de otra nacionalidad para vivir un espacio intercultural. Lo que pasa es que a veces o muchas veces nos homogenizamos cuando no es así. ¿Verdad? Cada uno de nosotros, inclusive el, cómo me levanté hoy, eh, qué sucedió hoy en mi vida cuando, cuando, antes de venir para acá, por ejemplo, ya, ya eso marca una diferencia cuando estás en un espacio de aprendizaje. Entonces, no sé si ustedes dentro de su experiencia en las universidades han desarrollado algún tipo de estrategia que permita precisamente, no solamente... Eh, dentro de aspectos como la metodología o la evaluación, sino esos otros aspectos que permitan una formación integral, ¿verdad? De cómo conocerme yo y cómo conocer al otro, cómo acercarme al otro, ¿verdad? Que nos ayuda no solamente al estudiante extranjero, sino también al que está en, la, en casa. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question, and it actually opens up a couple of different things. One of them is, is a one of the criticisms, because this is not a clean topic, there are lots of scholars out there who really criticize the whole idea of intercultural communication. They just think it's a, either doesn't make any sense or it's a bad path to go down. Uh, but let me start with the first part and then I'll talk about the criticism. In the first part, what we do uh, at the university is we just make sure that everyone is kind of part of this, right? Uh, in, in Canada, as you probably know, Canada is officially a bilingual country, French-English, but up until very recently, I'd say the last 10 years, what bilingualism has meant in Canada is bilingualism for the French. Now, yes, I'm biased because I'm French. In other words, if your first language is French, if you're a Francophone, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be able to also speak English. But if your first language is English and you're an Anglophone, probably you're not going to be able to speak French. French has, or sorry, bilingualism has been, has meant bilingualism for the French. Now, to be fair, in the last 10 years, that's changed. Uh, and we're finding, even in Quebec, a lot of Anglophones now are quite bilingual. But uh, anyway, so that's the, that was the danger for us back in 2012. You know, so we're bringing international students in. If we focus only on one population, then we're going to end up with like a ghetto, basically. So if we only focus on the international students and try to give them the tools to be interculturally sensitive, what do we do with the rest of them? Or if we only focus on the faculty members, what do we do, what do, we do with the rest of them? And so we were very conscious that everybody had to be included. What you're seeing here, what you saw here, is a general workshop, but I actually have specialty, specialized workshops. One for students, one for faculty, one for administration, 
uh, one that just focuses on teamwork, and I have all these ones, and so that's kind of how we've dealt with it, right? The criticism, one of the main criticisms, though, that gets leveled at this uh, as, a, as a scholarly study is they say, if, the, if we're doing all this work about being intercultural and everyone is going to be intercultural and I'm going to be, even though I'm Canadian, I'm going to be really sensitive to the Costa Rican culture and to the Chinese culture, doesn't that just make everything kind of watered down and we're just going to be this like one big homogenous culture? And isn't there a real danger of assimilation at that point? Right? So if we keep doing this, if we're all within 10 years, all interculturally sensitive, and that includes language, within 20 years, is everybody in the world going to be speaking English or Chinese or German? There'll only be one language in the world. So that's the criticism that gets leveled at that. Um, and I actually don't know how to respond to it. I mean, there, it, is a, it is a valid criticism, I think. It's, it's not one that I'm willing to accept entirely because the nature of my work requires me to be intercultural. I don't you know, I just have to. That's part of who I am. So, so yeah, th those are really, really good points. Thank you for sharing that. Tenemos dos preguntas más y cerramos. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Susan Solís de la UNED. Eh, profesor, ¿cómo define usted el concepto de integración? Y según su experiencia educativa a lo largo de, 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 de este tiempo, ¿ustedes se pueden decir que han logrado en la mayoría del tiempo de su experiencia esa integración, indistintamente o tomando en cuenta el tiempo y el espacio, y además si han determinado, han identificado si existe algún escenario ideal, si fuera el caso, ¿verdad? en ese contexto que ustedes se desarrollan, y cuál en este proceso, cuál ha sido el mayor reto que ustedes han enfrentado. Gracias. I just want to ask for a clarification on one word. Was it immigration or integration? Okay. So that's a really good question, and that pops up in my personal life and in my pref professional life as well. So there's, there, traditionally there have been sort of two models of immigration and integration. I'll, I'll roll them into one. The uh, American model has been called the uh, me melting pot. So you have to imagine the United States is this huge, imagine it, it's like cheese, I like cheese. So imagine it's this huge pot and you put different types of cheese in, brie and camembert and all this, you put all these cheeses in and they melt. And so what you have at the end of the day is, it's still cheese, but it's not camembert anymore, it's not brie, it's, I, I don't know what it is, but it's some melting pot of cheese. That's been the American model, and that's the way they see immigration and integration. So if you emigrate to the United States, you're, it, you, there's sort of an expectation that you will become part of the melting pot. Canada has never subscribed to that philosophy. We have called ourselves the tossed salad approach. So if, again, if you imagine it's a big bowl, we like the bowl. The bowl is a good metaphor. So you have a big bowl and you're going to make a salad. So you put in leaves and you put in tomatoes and you put in cucumbers and all this other stuff. At the end of the day, you can still pull the leaves out and the tomatoes out. They have not lost their integrity. They have not lost their identity. And yet they are all working together to make a big salad. So that's kind of the model that we have in Canada. And I find that model works better. And so that's kind of how we've done this integration part of it. When, again, when you start to operationalize that, some really interesting things start to happen. So one of the things that we see is, and it depends on the generation, and I always get the, the generational names wrong. Uh, when you emigrate to Canada, you're an immigrant, and then your kids become first generation. So what's interesting is we'll get families emigrating, say from China. China's a good example. And the parents very often don't really speak English. And the kids, they go to school, and so they learn English fairly quickly. We see really interesting things happen. The parents will often get really mad when the kids come home and speak Chinese. And it creates a situation that is absolutely absurd because the kid will come home, speak Spanish, uh, Spanish sorry, speak Chinese to the parents, the parents will get mad and say, no, you have to speak English because we're going to be Canadian. We're going to be the best Canadians, and to be the best Canadians, you've got to speak English. So the kids will switch to English, but the parents don't speak English. And so you wind up with this just absurd situation. 
So we sent, as I said to you, we, we sent our kids to Chinese school and we found that there were actually very few Chinese immigrant families in these Chinese schools. It was mostly mixed families like us or um, uh, Canadian families that had adopted kids from China. That's who was attending these Chinese schools. The immigrant families weren't going at all because they, want, they felt that in order to be good Canadians, in order to integrate, they had to give up their Chinese culture and that included language. And so it's a real challenge and it's ongoing. And when, when we meet those families who say that, we say, no, 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 no. Don't worry about the kids. They will learn English, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It's important that you maintain both cultures. And I tell them about the salad. It's a salad, you know, you're coming as a tomato and we're lettuce, you've got to keep those tomatoes because it's important. So that's been our approach uh, in Canada for the most part. I don't think we've been doing it long enough to know whether we're right, but in my heart, I think we're right. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, professor. Oh. Can you just mm. wait one second? He wants to leave? No. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Listo. Um, me llamó poderosamente la atención cuando usted decía que actualmente eh, sus alumnos van de 25 años hasta 80, habló hasta 83, ha llegado a tener, y que ahora logra ver que hay muchos estudiantes con necesidades especiales. Entiendo que esa es en la clase presencial, o también lo tiene en la virtualidad. Porque en el caso específico de la UNED, ¿verdad? nuestros estudiantes son a distancia y es más o menos una población parecida. ¿verdad? Tenemos estudiantes que acaban de egresar del colegio de 18 años hasta este, estudiantes de 80. Y entonces quisiera saber en esta integración que ustedes hacen, aparte del reto intercultural, está también, por ejemplo, la edad o estos eh, estudiantes de necesidades especiales se han tenido que involucrar también eh, retos de enfrentar barreras tecnológicas, por ejemplo, o si en su universidad tienen políticas de adecuaciones curriculares, por ejemplo, en, en las evaluaciones para hacerlas heterogéneas en lugar de homogéneas, porque en un momento lo escuché que decía, bueno, eh, les dije que hicieran un ensayo, una crítica, y lo hicieron todos diferente y no siguieron como el orden que yo dije. Entonces, al final, uno dijo, bueno, puede ser que lo haga una evaluación homogénea. Pero si llega en su universidad, tanto en la virtualidad como en la presencial, ¿cómo logran enfrentar ese, ese reto de integración más allá de la barrera intercultural, como la edad, la tecnología, eh, eh, educación especial, hacia la eh, evaluación más heterogénea? Si logran... A, aplicarlo no cómo lo hacen en la universidad mm. that's a really good question and and I know we're whoops sorry I know we're running short on time but it's interesting I mean one of the reasons I got involved in all this stuff not the intercultural piece but the online online learning piece was back in the late 80s early 90s uh, and it was exactly for that reason I recognized that there were a lot of people who wanted to do particularly higher education who could not because they were in wheelchairs, they couldn't see, uh, they had young families, um, maybe they were working in rural areas and there was no university there and so on. And to me, it just never made sense that we always had to have a model of bringing people to the education. Why not bring education to the people, right? That's the way I've always seen it. And so if you go on my website, you'll see that's actually my tagline, learning in hard to reach places. And we do that through technology and so it's by definition, those people that you're describing have always been drawn to online learning. And we don't know as instructors, I, I rarely know online if my students are having those sorts of challenges. But our universities do because we have spe uh, student services offices and they're very aware of what the special needs are. When we first started, I developed some of the very first online courses in Canada back in the 1990s. There were no learning management systems, we were just doing websites. And we recognized right away that differently able students were really attracted to our courses because they physically couldn't come onto campus. And so that, I was very excited about that. But then we realized what the challenges were. 
we would have visually impaired students and there were no screen readers in those days. Now screen readers are fairly easy, but this was like 1996. There were no screen readers in 1996. And so it was a real challenge. We actually, I was working at York University, which is a huge university in those days. We actually developed our own screen reader and gave it to our students for free. Um, but I mean, when you have a student population of 50,000 students, it's relatively easy to do that. We had the resources. That's not easy to do in a small university. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but, but that's, th those are some of the challenges and that's kind of how we met them. Yeah. Um, well, first, I would like to thank you in name of us, our preschooler students, because it's really important for us to know about multicultural ways to get to our students, to help them to learn, since they can be from different countries, they can mm -hmm. be from different cultures, their language can be different from our language, they don't necessarily need to speak Spanish, but we need, we need a way to get to them mm -hmm. and to teach them because they gotta be somebody when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we need to integrate everything and everyone so our kids can share the magical experience that learning is. And, well, your conference, we really wanna thank you because it really helped us to understand more. It can help us to understand more our students and their context so we can provide them a way of a better experience and a better learning. So thank you. Thank you. And just, this is more directed at you guys, but my older colleagues, you guys know this. Your students will remember you for the rest of your lives, for the rest of their lives, sorry. Um, so those types of influences that you're talking about are incredibly powerful, way more powerful than the influence that I have. Yeah, so good for you. I'm really pleased to see you guys here. That's great. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Robert. Y un aplauso para nuestro conferencista de hoy. Solamente unos anuncios. Si alguno de ustedes solamente va a asistir a la conferencia de hoy y no al taller de la tarde, eh, por favor llenar la evaluación de la conferencia. Si no, llenamos la evaluación de todo el día. Eh, la, el taller empezaría a la una de la tarde. Eh, espero verlos a todos acá. Uh, muchas gracias al doctor Robert Ocuan. Muchas gracias también a este. Sí, recuerden también devolver los eh, intercomunicadores de la traducción. Quiero agradecerles también a lo, al equipo técnico y líderes de Onda UNED, que gracias a ellos las dos conferencias del doctor Ocuan fueron transmitidas por internet a la red internacional. Un saludo a todos los que se conectaron también por Onda UNED. Muchas gracias a María Marta y a los compañeros, a los chicos de preescolar del curso de paradigmas pedagógicos. Es una palabra difícil esa. Y eh, los espero verlos a todos en la tarde. Eh, el doctor Ocuain también tiene tarjetas de representación. Si alguien quiere una tarjeta. Did you bring your cards? Did you bring... Se pueden acercar a él para una tarjeta. Eh, y puedan también seguir la comunicación con él por correo electrónico o internet.